In episode one, we get introduced to the Turners. Sean and Dorothy are new parents who have hired an 18-year-old girl named Leanne to be the nanny for their child, Jericho. They need a nanny because Dorothy is going back to work, where she is a field reporter for one of the local news channels in Philadelphia. Leanne shows up from Wisconsin at night, and Dorothy is thrilled that she's there. A little too thrilled. When she shows up, Jericho is upstairs sleeping because it's so late at night. And Leanne is insanely quiet, although, to be fair to her, Dorothy is talking a lot. Dorothy gives Leanne a tour of the house and shows her to her room. And as she's getting settled, Dorothy and Sean head downstairs, and Sean says, she's pretty quiet, right? I expected somebody more normal. Sean also mentions how he was expecting somebody a little bit older, but this conversation is stressing Dorothy out, so he just leaves it. Right before Leanne actually comes downstairs to meet with the Turners, she checks on Jericho, even though she knows that he's sleeping. Eventually, though, she comes downstairs and they start going through some normal conversation. You know, what are you into? It doesn't seem like she's into that much. She also dresses like my 80-year-old grandmother. She does, however, ask Sean what he does for a living. And what he does is he creates recipes for local restaurants that he sells to them. But this allows him to be home all day. Although, because he's working, he's not able to take care of his child. Thus, they need a nanny. All right, in fairness, they could take care of a baby, but... I'm from Philadelphia. I'm seeing where they're living. They can afford a nanny. He does tell her the one rule in the house is do not touch his coffee maker because it's very expensive and it's very finicky. Leanne then heads up to her room because it's pretty late at night and she just got there and Dorothy is giddy at her arrival. Sean goes to bring her a bottle of water but notices that the door is cracked and when he looks inside, she's praying. And I'm talking like full on, on your knees, hands clasped, praying. Stuff that you really only see from a nun. So he thinks it's weird but he just leaves the bottle there. At this point, though, everybody's going to bed, and Sean walks into Jericho's room, picks up the baby, and his head smashes against the crib. And that's because you find out that Jericho is a doll. And Sean, looking at the doll in the middle of the night, is weeping. Although, the next morning, when Leanne gets up, she acts like the doll's alive, changing its diaper, bringing him down. And this is the first day that Dorothy's going back to work. So she's on edge a little bit, but once she leaves, Sean says, okay, you can put it down now. I feel like we should probably discuss this, right? Although Leanne says, no, I'm fine like I am, and he continues to coddle this doll. He explains that their son Jericho died six weeks ago, and when it happened, Dorothy had a nervous breakdown. What Leanne is currently holding is called a reborn doll. It's supposed to help with the grieving process. They haven't told anybody that Jericho died. He was only 13 weeks old. They just didn't want the sympathy of grief. The only people that know that Jericho is dead are obviously the parents, Dorothy's father and her brother, Julian, and now Leanne. He says to her, I don't know how long this charade's going to stay, but you're paid till the end of the month. So my wife works long hours. Once she leaves, you can go and do whatever you want, really. I don't care. But instead of putting the doll down, she tells him, okay, I think I'm going to take Jericho for a walk now. And it's becoming clear to Sean that she's almost as weird as his wife. And while she's out walking this doll, he decides to investigate just exactly who he let in his house. He starts snooping through some of her drawers and he gets a splinter from a makeshift cross that she brought with her. And that night, after everybody's gone to bed and he heads into the baby's room, Leanne has hung that cross above the baby's crib. Dorothy goes to take a bath and Sean follows her in because he wants to have a conversation about this. He tells Dorothy she's really religious, like in a creepy way. And he doesn't mind the religion, he just doesn't really want it in his house. But she's not really listening because she's in a lot of pain from mastitis. She's still breastfeeding even though no one's drinking the milk. So everybody goes to bed and the next day, Dorothy's brother Julian shows up. He's really just showing up to see how hot the nanny is, but Sean lets him know, yeah, no, not hot at all. Not that I would anyway. They start talking about how weird it is that this girl is just going along with the charade, acting like this doll is alive. Later that day, when Dorothy gets home, her, Sean, and this doll go take a walk. And when they do that, Leanne walks around the house, putting some of Dorothy's jewelry on, pretending to live that sophisticated life, even taking a bath in what looks like the same bathtub that Dorothy takes a bath in. When the family gets home, though, Dorothy goes into the bathroom and Leanne sees Sean throw the doll down on the ground and kind of stares him down about it. So he picks the doll up and when Dorothy comes out of the bathroom, he gives the doll over. But after Dorothy goes upstairs, Leanne is still staring at Sean. Later that night, Dorothy once again takes a bath and for whatever reason, Leanne goes to check on her and Dorothy tells her that she's in a lot of pain from the mastitis. So, hey, you're getting paid 900 bucks to take care of a baby. You want to earn that money, and Leanne decides to help out, saying that all she needs to do is clear the blockage, and she starts rubbing on her tits. It's weird, but it does end up working. The next day, Dorothy heads to work, and Leanne tells Sean, I'm putting Jericho down for his nap right now, and then after that, I need to run to the pharmacy for some stuff for Dorothy. Can you keep an ear out for him? And Sean snaps at her. She's not here, meaning Dorothy isn't here. You don't have to keep up with the charade, and I'm not going to listen out for a baby. 
She ends up coming home, and he heads downstairs to work on his recipe. And when he does that, he thinks he hears a baby crying. Kind of brushes it off. But when he goes upstairs, he once again thinks he hears a baby crying. This time, it's a lot louder. And when he goes to investigate in the room, sure enough, the doll is gone, and there is a living child crying in the crib. So in episode two, Sean is just waiting for Dorothy to come home. She gets driven home by a cab, but when the cab arrives at her house, Dorothy is kind of like in a trance state. It takes a little bit of time for her to snap out of it. But when she walks in the room, instead of being troubled by the fact there is a human child in her crib instead of a doll, she acts like this is business as usual. And that's really bizarre to Sean. He heads downstairs to confront Leanne, asking, okay, whose kid is that? But Leanne says, well, that's your kid, Mr. Turner. That's Jericho. And he wants to question her more, but he gets interrupted when Dorothy brings down this real child, asking Leanne to go give him a bath. Sean is trying to make sense of everything that's going on right now, but he realizes he needs to be very careful for how he approaches things because his wife is in an extremely fragile state. During dinner, he asks her, where did you find this girl? And she says, well, I put it out on Twitter, and a guy I used to work with recommended somebody, but that person had already found a new family. And I think she shared the post because... I got eight new resumes, and she was one of them. And Sean's a little troubled by the fact that they just let somebody in who was a friend of a friend of an acquaintance. But Dorothy thinks that Leanne is great, and she's a godsend. That night, Sean goes to the nursery and is just staring at this child who he knows doesn't belong to him. Then he sees that makeshift cross and decides to get rid of it, tearing it down, breaking it in half, and putting it in the garbage disposal of all places. He then tries to walk out with Jericho in the middle of the night, but when he goes to disarm the house alarm, he puts the code in and it doesn't work, and he puts it in again and again, and finally it triggers the alarm, waking up the entire household. He can't figure out why the code wasn't working, and he's especially perplexed when Dorothy comes downstairs and puts in the same exact code he was using, and that works. She wants to know where he was going with Jericho, and he says, oh, I was going for a drive. It helped soothe them. But when Dorothy takes Jericho back upstairs, Leanne, who has woken up, is staring down Sean. He wants to talk to Dorothy about it the next day before she goes to work, but she's in a rush and says, we'll talk about whatever you want when I come home. So he waits for a shipment of food, and when it arrives, he's bringing it in the house, but he gets a nasty splinter in his foot. And while he's getting the splinter out of his foot, he FaceTimes Julian, his brother-in-law, and says, you got to get over here ASAP. I can't talk to you about what I want to over this video, but you need to get over here. Julian's already headed over there that night anyway, because he's coming over to the house for dinner for his birthday, but Sean assures him, this can't wait. You need to come over ASAP. Later that day, Sean wants to continue doing some investigative research, and when Leanne goes to take Jericho for a walk, he goes into Dorothy's office and sees the eight resumes that were submitted for the job, and all of them are really professional-looking, all of them except one, and that's Leanne's. Leanne was a handwritten note, and it was really super weird. It described her waking up and looking at the sun and wondering if somebody in China was looking at the same sun and how she wanted to travel. While reading it, Sean realizes that his finger is bleeding. So he goes to take care of that. At this point, Leanne and this baby have arrived back home. She takes Jericho upstairs but notices that the cross is gone. And she seems kind of surprised about it because she's frozen still. Sean, meanwhile, figures that he's got a splinter problem. So he starts frantically sanding the floors. But then there's a knock at the door and it's Julian wondering what couldn't wait. So he takes Julian upstairs quietly so he doesn't alert Leanne and shows him this baby that's in the crib. And then he sneaks back downstairs to have a conversation about it, and he fills Julian in on everything that's happened. But Julian's big concern is the fact that Sean didn't actually see Leanne bring home this baby. And it's theoretically possible that it was actually Dorothy who brought the baby home. He asked Sean, well, have you done any research? I mean, are there any missing babies? And Sean hasn't. So Julian is going to look into it, but he needs to get back to work. Dorothy gets home that night from work, and she's not thrilled about the fact that Sean was sanding the floors. But the splinter problem has gotten worse, and somehow... He's got splinters in his ass, and he needs Dorothy to get them out. Sean is getting more and more stressed out, especially with Dorothy acting like Leanne is some savior. He says, she's not. We don't even know if she's trustworthy. But Dorothy doesn't really pay attention to the comment, trying, it seems like, to get something physical started, asking him if he wants to flip over so she could check his front. But that actually annoys him. He says, well, what are you going to do about it if I am ready? I mean, we haven't had sex in over a year. And that really pisses off Dorothy, who yells at him and says that he deserves a medal of valor for not getting any for a year. They do need to put on a good face, though, because Julian is coming over for his birthday dinner. And Julian makes an excuse to head downstairs and have a private conversation with Sean, where he lets him know that I looked into it and there are no missing babies that fit the baby's description of the kid that you have. They then start talking about what they're going to do with this child. 
But Julian says it's been six weeks. You need to come to the realization that Dorothy might never snap out of this. It's pretty clear that nobody's looking for this baby. So is it the worst thing in the world if you guys keep it? I mean, it's like no harm, no foul. She accepted the doll and she clearly is accepting this child. I mean, going to the police is a no-go. And Sean agrees with that. But he can't believe that Julian is implying they should really keep this child. They head upstairs and Julian starts questioning Dorothy on how much she actually knows about this nanny. And as soon as he starts doing it, Dorothy knows where the questioning is coming from. She knows it's coming from Sean. She also realizes, though, that Julian hasn't actually met the nanny. And they agree to invite her downstairs for dinner. And Leanne has spent pretty much the entire night making another makeshift cross and hanging it back in Jericho's nursery. But when Dorothy goes to check on her, it seems like she's about to go to bed, although she convinces her to put on some earrings and a hideous-looking outfit and come downstairs. And when she does, it seems like Julian is really into her. He starts kind of hitting on her, flirting with her, if you will, and insists on pouring her champagne for the toast. He starts asking her what she likes about the city of Philadelphia, and Dorothy reveals that she hasn't really explored the city, which is a shame because this city is awesome, by the way. That's just a side note. But she says that she likes a coffee shop down the street, and the park where she walks Julian. They then have the toast, and they toast Julian because it's his birthday, but he toasts Leanne and welcomes her to the Turner family. As they start to eat dinner, though, Sean, who hasn't said much, comments on the fact that he can't taste the food. Now, he didn't cook the food. Dorothy did, and Dorothy takes it as an insult. But then he mentions how he can't taste the wine either. And then he starts hacking up a lung and has to excuse himself, and he goes in the bathroom and coughs up a massive splinter when he comes downstairs to confront dorothy about it assuming that the splinter came from the sauce because of the wooden label in the pot dorothy is in another trance she's got the refrigerator open just staring at this cake that she made and sean can't get her to snap out of it and when julian comes in he can't get her to snap out of it either and he thinks it's really weird but sean thinks maybe this is the moment where she snaps out of everything and remembers what happened to julian the only thing that gets her to snap out of it is when she hears the new baby crying and when she does snap out of it she acts like everything was fine she goes upstairs to check on the baby and Julian turns to Sean and says, well, you're not getting rid of that kid tonight. In episode three, Sean gets a text message from Julian in the middle of the night to head outside. And when he does, he gets in a car and Julian is with another guy who is a private investigator that Julian knows. Sean and Julian have had this guy look into who exactly Leanne is. And there's really no social media trace of her at all. But there is record of a Leanne Grayson being born in Wisconsin. So Julian and this private investigator are going to fly out to Wisconsin in the morning and go and check out and see exactly what they're dealing with. Problem is, they need a picture of her. And Sean says, oh, no problem. I'll get the one from the resume because her resume had a picture attached to it. But when Sean goes back inside and looks at the resumes, her resume is suddenly gone. It's missing. And it forces Sean to walk into her bedroom and take a picture of her while she's sleeping. Which, by the way, insanely bizarre behavior. But gets the job done and he sends it to Julian and Julian and the PI head out to Wisconsin. Sean the next day has to get ready to cater a private event. His sous chef, Toby, comes over to start helping him out. And Sean is very stressed out because his fish shipment hasn't arrived yet. He's also stressed out because he has no taste buds. And it's worth mentioning that this show was done pre-COVID, so Sean could be patient one in the U.S., but I digress. Sean gets a knock at the door, and it is his fish shipment, so he goes to grab that, and Leanne brings Jericho downstairs with Dorothy introducing Leanne to Toby, explaining what Toby does. Sean then walks in with the fish shipment, and it's a bunch of eels. They're squirming all around, and to kill it, Sean ends up smacking it against the table, although it continues to squirm. In order to get it to stay still, Sean nails it to the table. But once again, this thing continues to squirm. And as Toby and Sean start to skin it, Leanne is visibly upset. It's kind of the first sign of normalcy from her. But she gets so uncomfortable that she actually faints. And Toby has to bring her upstairs. When she wakes up, Dorothy is on her bedside making sure that she's okay. Leanne apologizes to her, calling her Mrs. Turner. But Dorothy says, stop calling me that. Call me Dorothy. And by the way, me and you, we're going to be best friends. Downstairs, though, as Sean continues to get his food ready for the event, he gets a FaceTime from Julian letting him know that they've arrived in Wisconsin and they're heading over to the house that is of record for the Grayson residence. When he heads back to the kitchen, though, Dorothy is waiting for him. She hands him Jericho and tells him that her and Leanne are going to head out to Center City to grab some lunch and kind of have a girl's day because Dorothy's off. She also makes Sean apologize to Leanne for making her feel uncomfortable which Sean reluctantly does. But shortly after they leave, Sean gets another FaceTime from Julian. And this time they're at the house. But the house 
has been damaged in a fire. They go into it just to see if they can see anything, and the house has been badly damaged. It smells horrible, and there's no real family heirlooms there, no pictures of anything. But something does catch Sean's eye in the video. And that is a handmade woven cross, just like the one that was above Jericho's bed. And it definitely freaks Sean out. But he has to end the call because the girls have gotten home. But instead of revealing this to Dorothy, knowing that it's a delicate situation, he just asks her, hey, what did you guys talk about? Did she tell you anything about herself, where she came from? But Dorothy says, no, not really. She's pretty quiet. We really just talked about me. Dorothy then says, though, that they should have a date night because Leanne has offered to watch Jericho that night for free and they want to take advantage of it. So she tells Sean, book a table somewhere and we'll go out. But before he gets ready that night, he pays Toby a hundred bucks to stay in the house, finish up some prep work, but mainly keep an eye on things. And as he's handing over the Benjamin Franklin upstairs, Dorothy is getting ready for her date, but talking to her new best friend. Leanne asks her how her and Sean met, but she says, no, enough of me. I want to know about the real Leanne Grayson. They're a guy at home, and Leanne seems to be uncomfortable with this topic and doesn't give an answer, but it leads Dorothy to think that there is, in fact, somebody at home waiting for her. She then tells Leanne, hey, if you ever want to borrow any of my things, just let me know. Just ask. And then she heads downstairs to head out with Sean. But before they do leave, Dorothy kisses him, and then her hand travels down the pants into the fun place, just like high school, over the pants. And Leanne is watching all of this go down, although the Turners have no idea. Once they do leave, though, Leanne ends up blasting some classical music, just like any normal 18-year-old would, but also putting on some of Dorothy's jewelry, some of her makeup, and heading downstairs and running into Toby, who was kind of weirded out by the classical music, but Leanne asks him if he wants to have a drink with her. And this is really bizarre behavior because before, when offered alcohol, she was acting like she was stringent to the whole being 21. The only time she did drink was when she was peer pressured to do it by Julian. But Toby's a young kid, She's 18 years old. They're in a house by themselves. Yeah, okay, I'll have a drink. And while they're sipping on this Zinfandel, she asks him, hey, are you hungry? And he says, yeah, I could eat. And Toby starts looking through the refrigerator for some food, mentioning a bunch of things. But then all of a sudden, there's a smack behind him. And it's because Leanne had grabbed one of the eels and smashed its head against the table. So I guess she's over that whole killing the eel thing. Toby, though, is a shoe chef, so he whips up some food. But just as the two are about to sit down to eat, there's a knock at the door, and it's Julian. And Julian tells Toby, you can go home, leaving Toby outside completely perplexed as to how he just got cock-blocked. Julian then goes inside and sees Leanne wearing his sister's jewelry, wearing her makeup, drinking her wine, and he thinks he might have a gold digger on his hands. He tries to tough talk her saying, if you want to get to Dorothy, you have to get through me. But then she completely gets him off his game by asking, were you here when it happened? Did they call you for help? And it totally throws Julian off. He doesn't really know what to do. So he just gets out and pours out the rest of the wine. But Leanne gets really close to him and mimics what Dorothy did to Sean with the over-the-pants move. And Julian's uncomfortable but doesn't stop it. The two are interrupted when the Turners come home, and they're pretty surprised to see Julian there, but he says, ah, I was in the neighborhood. He's really come to give Sean an update on what they found. He shows them a video of as they were leaving this little small farm town in Wisconsin, they saw a cemetery and decided to stop by. And sure enough, they found the gravestones of the Graysons, Leanne's mother, Leanne's father, but then they found the gravestone of Leanne Grayson. So who the hell is this person in their house? They head outside to get out of earshot, and Julian thinks that she might be there trying to blackmail the family because she didn't seem all that shocked when the baby ended up being a doll. He thinks that somehow she might have gotten this information previously. But everything's on the table because no one knows what the hell is going on or who the hell she is. The last thing Julian says before he leaves is, the longer that thing stays here, the longer this is going to cost you. And then he takes off. And when Sean walks back in the house... He can hear Jericho crying, so he heads upstairs to coddle him and soothe him, but he's also trying to make sense of everything he just heard. In episode four, Sean can't sleep and gets up in the middle of the night and goes to the bathroom, and Dorothy follows him in there because she also has to go. Dorothy asks him to check on Jericho, but it, when he goes to do so, Jericho is not in his crib, and he can hear Jericho crying from Leanne's bedroom. He decides to leave it as is and gets back in bed and tells Dorothy everything's fine. But he's definitely perplexed by it. The next morning, he's still trying to make sense of it, which is becoming a theme for him. Dorothy comes downstairs before work and asks him what recipe he'll be working on that day. And he tells her it's lobster ice cream, which she finds disgusting. But he's making it to dispel the myth that it is disgusting. And after she goes to work, he whips up a nice batch of that delicious lobster ice cream. The issue is he still can't taste any of it. This guy has no idea if this ice cream sucks or it's great. 
He still knows that he needs to find out more on Leanne. And while she's preparing dinner that night, he sneaks up to her bedroom and is able to get in between the walls, drilling a tiny hole in her wall and putting a nanny cam in there. So now he's got access to her room, which is incredibly creepy if you don't know the context. You just think he's a peeping Tom. But he doesn't have those intentions. He just wants to know who the hell this person is. Dorothy comes home that night and immediately calls for Leanne to come downstairs with Jericho. And when she does, she asks Leanne, do you have any plans tomorrow? And Leanne doesn't. So Dorothy says, great. All the people at the news stations can't wait to meet Jericho. So she's got plans to bring him in there to show off Jericho while Leanne watches him as Dorothy does her job. But Sean doesn't want that to happen. Sean doesn't want Dorothy parading around this child that Sean knows isn't actually his. He also knows, though, that he can't just come out and say that. So he tells her that he doesn't think it's the best move because of the fact that he's not old enough. But it seems like Dorothy's pretty set on it, and Leanne is excited about the opportunity. But Sean isn't ready to let this die. And when Dorothy goes upstairs to take her bath, he follows her in there and starts telling her that he really doesn't think this is a good idea. Deciding to go with the argument that Jericho is small and fragile, and they'll show him off when the time is right, but this isn't it. And he's able to actually change her mind. The two head off to bed, but shortly afterwards, Sean goes and watches the nanny cam footage to see, sure enough, Leanne is taking Jericho in with her at night. Although, she needs to get to bed because she's got an early morning. The next day, when Dorothy gets up to go to work, Leanne is downstairs, all dressed, along with Jericho, who, by the way, is looking at her like, this bitch is crazy. But Leanne didn't want to make Dorothy late. She didn't know what time they had to leave, so she got up super early and got everything ready. The problem is, nobody told Leanne that their plan was off. So Dorothy heads upstairs to go brush her teeth, and she feels really bad about this. It's obvious that Leanne was really looking forward to it. But Sean says, fuck her feelings. You're not taking them in. And Sean's a little ornery because of the fact that something is in his eye. He can't quite figure it out. And to make matters worse, when he asks Leanne to check it out, she blows toothpaste in it. So he's in a bad mood when he heads downstairs, sporting a sweet eye patch. He grabs Jericho and just tells Leanne, yeah, it's not happening. And Leanne is kind of left in shock. Definitely disappointed that they're not heading out with Dorothy. Later that day, as Sean is preparing his recipe, it seems like his eye is fine, by the way, Julian stops over with a new bottle of wine that is pretty hard to come by. He pours both of them a glass, but Sean once again can't taste anything, which is frustrating him. Sean then reveals to him, though, that he set up the nanny cam, which Julian's first thought is, have you seen her without clothes on? But Sean brushes that comment off, telling Julian... How every single night she's taking this baby in with her, which is weird. That's unusual behavior. It crosses a line. But because of it, Sean thinks he's got this whole thing figured out. What if this baby was Leanne's the entire time? What if she snuck into their house with this baby and simply switched out the doll for her own child? It would make sense because she's nurturing the child at night. That's the only reason she's doing it. She's obviously extremely religious. She covered her tracks, but she wants to give her child a good life. And this is it. But Julian says, you want to keep the child, don't you? I mean, you just pitched me a fairy tale princess movie. Just say it. You want to keep the baby. And after a little hemming and hawing, Sean looks at him and says, well, wouldn't you? And while the two were having this discussion, Leanne is upstairs with Jericho watching Dorothy on the news. She's reporting from City Hall where there's a big case and they're waiting for the jury to come in with the verdict. And that gives Leanne an idea. She takes Jericho out for one of her, quote, walks, but she doesn't walk anywhere. Because later on, as Sean is watching the news and watching the verdict come in, in the background, he sees Leanne with Jericho watching Dorothy do the news. And when Dorothy gets home, the first question Sean has is, where is she? But Dorothy has no idea what he's talking about because Leanne never approached her. Shortly after that, though, Leanne walks to the door and Sean confronts her, saying, do you have anything to tell us? And Leanne admits, I took the bus downtown. I saw the news camera, so I knew you'd be there, but I didn't want to bother you because you seemed busy. I did want Jericho to see what his mom did, though. And Sean isn't buying this at all, but Dorothy loves it. She's only mad about the fact that Leanne didn't walk up because people from the news station would want to meet Jericho. She tells Dorothy, come on in, let's go watch the footage. And as they're watching baby Jericho's TV debut, she turns to Leanne and says, is this their first time on TV? And Leanne says, yeah, but it's not sitting right with Sean at all. Late that night, Sean gets up to continue to prep recipes, and down walks Leanne looking for a midnight snack. And to Sean's surprise, she grabs the lobster ice cream, not caring that it's lobster ice cream. He's silent for a while, but eventually he can't hold his tongue and says, why did you disobey me? I told you not to go down there with Jericho. And she sticks to her story that she went down there on the bus, but he cuts her off and saying, come on. And finally, she admits, Dorothy promised me that I could see her work. She promised me. 
admitting that this whole thing was premeditated. He gets really, really angry when she refers to the baby as Jericho. He tells her, don't call him that. You can call him that around Dorothy, but don't call him that around me. And Leanne is confused because Jericho was the name that Sean picked out. But Sean admits that Jericho wasn't their first name. In fact, Jericho wasn't even their first baby because Dorothy kept having miscarriages. She has an overaggressive immune system that attacks any foreign body. And it just led to them losing baby after baby. And Dorothy blamed herself. She was thinking she was killing these kids. It got to the point where they couldn't even have sex. He tells Leanne, I don't want to put her through that again. So if there's a way, but Leanne cuts him off saying chocolate sauce, meaning the ice cream needs chocolate sauce. And that is a revelation to Sean, who hasn't been able to taste the ice cream, and now he knows how to perfect the recipe. And it seems like he's actually appreciative of what Leanne told him, but as she's going back upstairs, he says, I gotta ask you, why us? And Leanne just looks at him and says, I know I'd be happy here, and then goes upstairs. But she waits for Sean to go to bed, and when he does, she heads downstairs and pulls some news footage, because Dorothy keeps all of her news footage. And she picks a particular video, March 11th, 2011, where Dorothy is interviewing a bunch of nine-year-old kids at a beauty pageant. And one of those kids is Leanne Grayson from Wisconsin. Episode 5 starts out with everybody's favorite day, payday. But in the Turner household, it's pretty informal, with Sean just slipping an envelope of cash under Leanne's door. She comes downstairs to find Sean yelling for Dorothy, and Sean says, Can you go check on her? And when Leanne does, Dorothy is in one of those zombie-like states. When Leanne touches her, she snaps out of it, but she's giving Leanne crazy eyes. Although she has the audacity to say that it's Sean who's acting weird because he's being nice, but apparently Sean's not nice to anybody. And to put her mind at ease, Leanne says, I'm sure he's not having an affair with anybody. But that was the farthest thing from Dorothy's mind. Although now it's on Dorothy's mind. Just wasn't the right place to say that. Sean tells Leanne, I'm not going to be around much this week. You'll be all right on your own, right? And Leanne says, I won't be alone. I'll have Jericho. But as Leanne's leaving the house, taking Jericho on one of his walks, she notices that there's a guy parked in a car outside just sitting in it. She didn't think anything of it. Now she's walking in the street, passing a stoop. She passes a girl around her age with a little girl probably about the age of six. Although when she returns home, the door is open and she's a little freaked out. She hears something in the basement and when she goes to investigate, she finds Toby. Toby was told to come over and do some prep work. And she starts to yell at him for leaving the door open, but he says, I didn't come through the front door. I came through the side. I used the spare key under the grill. He shows her one of the items that he brought over for Sean, and it's a box full of crickets. But their conversation is derailed when there's a knock at the door, and it's that girl about her age who was on the stoop. And she's knocking on the door because Leanne forgot to bring in Jericho's stroller, which isn't the smartest move in the city. I literally had one stolen outside of my house when I just ran in for two minutes. That's why I implore you to just let the ads run. I have to buy a new one. I digress. This girl's name is Wanda. She's with a little girl named Olivia, and she tells Leanne that they're locked out of their place. But she is familiar with who the Turners are, so it's not really raising any red flags. Although, she's not really acting the part of somebody that lives on the block because she keeps complimenting how nice the house is and looking up how much it went for. When Toby comes upstairs, he sees this random girl sitting on the couch with a six-year-old and asks Leanne, is everything okay? But Leanne shoos him off, saying, yeah, everything's fine. You can leave now. Although Wanda gets a phone call and excuses herself. But when she comes back, she tells Leanne that she has to run downtown and pay a fine or her boyfriend is getting deported. And she asks Leanne if she can watch Olivia for a little bit. Leanne says, yeah, no problem. So Wanda heads off, promising she's only going to be about an hour. And Leanne and Olivia decide to play hide-and-go-seek. And Leanne is the seeker to start out, and she checks down in the cellar. When she goes in there, she hears something on the ground, and when she picks up a box, there's a giant rat. Somehow that does not freak her out. I mean, this thing is massive. But what really catches her eye is a onesie. It's crumpled up, it's dirty. She's kind of wondering what it's doing there. Although when she hears footsteps upstairs, she runs up and checks on Olivia, who lets her know that a guy was in the house and ran out. It really freaks Leanne out, and her, Olivia, and Jericho wait on the stoop for Wanda to come back, who eventually does, apologizing for taking so long and saying, okay, I can take Olivia home now. And as Leanne is watching Wanda and Olivia walk back to their house, because it's only about a block away, she notices that that car that was parked outside with the guy sitting in it is still there. Although she has to go run out and get supplies because she's running low on tomato soup, the only food that she seems to eat. She does that, puts it away, and even catches Dorothy's story that night on hygiene problems at the makeup stations and stores but then she gets a knock on her bedroom door and it's dorothy asking her if she wants a piece of cake and when poor leanne says yeah i'd love some cake instead of handing her cake dorothy hands her cash saying it's about 40 minutes there and back and leanne doesn't seem to really have a choice 
So she heads out to go get the Turner some cake. Luckily, though, don't worry. She gets to keep the change. But when she returns with the cake, she goes upstairs to give Dorothy what she just spent 40 minutes going to get to find out that Dorothy and Sean are having sex. I mean, good for them, but kind of rude. And Leanne heads back to her bedroom, doesn't eat the cake, but what she does do is open up her Bible and write Dorothy in one of the margins. The next day when Leanne wakes up, Dorothy has a giant zit on her face from the makeup bar. But Leanne brings up the fact that, quote, you didn't eat your cake, and Dorothy lies to her saying that her and Sean just had an early night, but thanks her for going to get it. After the Turners leave for work, Leanne once again takes Jericho out and notices that the same guy is in the same car outside. The guy is the P.I. She walks across the street and goes to Wanda's house, but when she knocks on the door, she finds out that there is no Wanda. Nobody by that description lives there. There's no Olivia. There's nobody. She was lied to. And this revelation is really upsetting to Leanne. When she returns home from the walk, she notices that once again, someone is in the house. And she starts to go from room to room when she hears the person come downstairs. The PI, though, doesn't notice her, punches in the security code, and leaves. And you gotta figure he was there just collecting information. But after he leaves, Leanne seems a little more comfortable and does some laundry. She even washed that onesie that she found in the basement. And as she's folding it, she hears a cricket. She goes to put it back in the box, but all of the crickets that were in there are gone. She doesn't really think anything of it, though. She heads upstairs and starts dressing up Jericho in that onesie. But when Sean sees it, he gets enraged asking, where the hell did you find that? You can tell he's really upset about this, and it kind of catches Leanne off guard. Leanne's saved, though, when Dorothy comes in and asks what everybody wants her food, Indian or Greek. And Sean doesn't care because he can't taste anything, and the only thing that Leanne eats is tomato soup, so it's on Dorothy. That night, though, Leanne is brushing her teeth, and she hears yet another cricket. This one is coming out of the sink. Once again, though, she doesn't really think anything of it. She heads downstairs to overhear a conversation between Sean and Julian about getting her out of the house. Julian calls her a freak and tells Sean, let her know she's not welcome. If it was up to him, he would shut up the heat in her room. But Sean yells at him, saying, that's really your answer? Practical jokes? Because Sean is holding a can of dog food. And after overhearing this conversation, when Leanne heads back upstairs, she writes Sean's name in one of those margins. The next morning, though, when she wakes up, her entire bed and her entire bedroom floor are covered in crickets. And one by one, she actually recollects them and puts them back in the box in the cellar. She returns upstairs to find Dorothy trying to get another splinter out of Sean, this time a giant one in his neck. And after they do that, she grabs some duct tape because she heads upstairs to start duct taping the vents to make sure no more crickets get in. But one has, she traps it under her glass, and heads downstairs to make some more tomato soup. But when she puts it in the pot, it looks nothing like tomato soup. It doesn't smell like tomato soup. So she goes to throw it out. And that's when she finds the dog food stuff. She knows that she's being messed with, and it's not sitting well with her at all. She doesn't have a lot of time to dwell on it, though, because she gets a knock at the door, and it's Wanda and Olivia. And she doesn't reveal to them that she knows they don't live in that house. They just walk in and start kind of hanging out. And it seems like Olivia wants a snack. And when Leanne says, hey, is this cool? Gesturing to the lobster ice cream, Wanda says, yeah, I don't care. Even though she previously told Leanne not to feed her because she's allergic to everything. And I guess that information has slipped Leanne's mind because she gives her a bowl of ice cream. Wanda starts to pitch Leanne on leaving the Turners because she can get a better job somewhere else in the city. But Leanne tells her, I'm not leaving. She then walks over and just staring outside of the window. And everything that's happened in the last couple days is coming to a crescendo. She's speaking aloud, saying, how was I supposed to know about that onesie? And if she wanted me out of the house, she just could have asked. Wanda's kind of curious on what the hell she's talking about, but then all of a sudden Olivia starts hacking up a lung because she's allergic to the ice cream. And Wanda realizes she's having an allergic reaction. She frantically tries to get her EpiPen, but she's just unloading her purse, and the EpiPen actually ends up going near Leanne's foot. But in this frantic state, Wanda can't find it. And instead of helping, Leanne just screams, You don't live on this block, do you, Wanda? Who sent you? Who told you to be friends with me? And Wanda reveals that it was Julian. Julian paid her to befriend her and try to convince her to leave. The whole time, Wanda is begging her to help out Olivia, and finally, Leanne picks up the EpiPen, stabs her, and sends them on their way. That night, while she's in her room, Leanne definitely feels like she's been betrayed, but she gets a knock at her bedroom door, and it's Sean wanting to know if he can borrow her for five minutes, because Sean still doesn't have any taste buds. And the crickets weren't just pets, they were food. He's injecting these baked crickets with a sort of fruit, but he needs a taste subject, and it seems like Leanne's palate's pretty good. She picks up one of the crickets and says, my aunt used to say that when a cricket came into your home, something bad was coming. And Sean asks, what's coming, Leanne? But Leanne doesn't answer, simply popping the cricket into her mouth and telling Sean that it's too sticky. 
And Sean changes the crickets up a little bit, has Leanne test him, and actually thanks her, saying, I couldn't do this without you. But Leanne isn't in a smiling mood at the moment. She goes upstairs where that cricket that she left is dead. She undresses and starts whipping herself. And as she's whipping herself, suddenly that cricket ends up coming back to life. In episode six, Dorothy gets the mail, and shockingly, there's a letter for Leanne. She tells her about the letter, leaves it on the table, but the Turners have to run out because Sean needs to catch a flight. He's going with the Philadelphia Eagles, go birds, to cater an event on the road, and she has to drive him to the airport. So they take off, and after they do, Leanne goes and opens up her letter, but when she does, she has a look of horror on her face. And it's not really a letter, it's more of a postcard that says, found you. She puts the postcard aside and continues to go about her day, but there's a knock at the door. It's a man drenched because it's pouring out, and this guy doesn't have an umbrella. And when Leanne opens the door, she once again has a look of horror on her face. She recognizes this guy. She lets him in, and he asks if the Turners are home, but she says, no, work. And then she instructs him to take his shoes off because Dorothy doesn't like shoes in the house, which is weird because she's wearing hers. But this guy's suit that he's wearing is pretty tattered up, and the shoes that he's wearing have holes all over it. He's not wearing socks. Looks like he just walked here from Wisconsin. And his feet are pretty gross. But his main concern is with Jericho. They go upstairs and he's holding Jericho in his arms, looking at the baby. Later that day when Dorothy gets home, she sees Leanne's postcard and she's a little freaked out by it too. When she heads upstairs to go check on Jericho, she can tell that something's wrong with Leanne who's holding Jericho on the bed. And that's when this guy pops out, introducing himself as Leanne's Uncle George. And the Turners had no idea that Leanne even had family. He tells Dorothy that he was in town and he just wanted to check on her. And Dorothy's a little freaked out, but she's trying to be cordial. George has brought a gift for Jericho, and it's a marionette of a chef that's supposed to be Sean. It's made from wood back in their hometown. And it's creepy as hell looking, but Dorothy, being polite, thanks him. She then invites him to stay for dinner. And since this guy looks like he could use a free meal, he accepts. So Dorothy starts whipping up some food. And as she's doing so, she's FaceTiming Sean to see how he's doing. But he notices that she's making a lot of food. And Dorothy lets him know it's because they have a guest, Leanne's uncle. And that doesn't sit right with Sean at all. He says, who the hell is in our house? But Dorothy says, well, it's okay. Leanne vouched for him. And he shoots that down right away saying, well, then who the hell vouched for her? But Dorothy just rushes him off, finishes the meal, and when she puts it on the table, she gets ready just to eat it, but George grabs her wrist. It really scares Dorothy, but there wasn't any malicious intent. He did so to pray. Dorothy starts trying to make conversation, but neither George or Leanne are giving her much back. And that's when Dorothy notices that George is drying the chicken out, patting it with his napkin. Dorothy doesn't say anything, but she does ask him, what do you do? And he says, salvage. He then starts wringing the chicken out. And even going so far as to grab Leanne's napkin to do so. More extremely bizarre behavior from this guy. When Dorothy gives Leanne a compliment, George says that Leanne was the most beautiful baby. Although you wouldn't know it by looking at her now. George tells Dorothy that there's been issues back home and Leanne is needed. But this takes Dorothy completely off guard and she says that doesn't really fit in with our plans. And George shoots back, do you have a contract? To which Dorothy says we have a verbal one. And he reminds her, yeah, for one month just so you could fire her if you didn't like her. Thankfully for everybody, this awkward conversation is broken up when Julian rings the doorbell and comes in. He was called by Sean to make sure everything's okay. And shortly after arriving, Jericho is heard crying on the baby monitor. But when Leanne goes up to attend to him, George snaps at her, saying, what hours do you work? And to try and not cause confrontation, Dorothy says, I'll go look after him. And that's when Julian sits down and says, you want to tell me who the hell you are? But George sticks to the script saying, I'm like you, Julian. I'm an uncle. Julian goes upstairs to the nursery when George and Leanne are busy washing and drying the dishes. And Dorothy says, we have a big problem. But the problem has nothing to do with this creep that's in their house. It has to do with the fact that Leanne is being taken from them. That's what she thinks is the big deal. And Julian says, good, let them. But Dorothy's not about to let that happen. She heads downstairs to the kitchen, and George says, I think we should go now. Train leaves in the morning. We'll get a hotel somewhere near the train station. But Dorothy, trying to force a stay of execution, if you will, insists that George sleep the night there because it is still pouring outside. And after being peer pressured by Leanne to do the same, George reluctantly accepts. But when Julian found out that Dorothy invited this guy to stay the night, he can't believe at what his sister just did. Even though she reassures him, I know what I'm doing. He immediately goes outside and FaceTimes Sean to let him know that this creep is staying. And he promises Sean that he will also stay. He'll sleep on the couch, make sure nothing weird happens. Upstairs, however, Dorothy is setting up the couch for George. And George says, call me old-fashioned, but a child's place is with her family. 
And Dorothy says, I couldn't agree more, but Leanne is hardly a child. And then George shows Dorothy a picture of Dorothy when she was a little girl and her mother. And he asks her, when did your mother die, Dottie? And Dorothy admits that Dottie was the nickname that her mother used to call her. Although the bigger question is, how does George know any of this? And that's a question that Dorothy never asks. Later that night, though, she tries to make the hiring official by bringing Leanne a contract. She apologizes, saying they should have done it a long time ago. And she's including a pay bump, telling her how much they like having her there. And it's actually bringing Leanne to tears because she does want to stay. So Dorothy says, we just have to convince your uncle that it's the wise move for you to stay. Both of us, together. So everybody goes to sleep, but Julian is awoken in the middle of the night when he hears a bang. And when he goes to check on George, George isn't there. He checks just about every room in the house. And when he can't find George, he goes to wake up Dorothy saying, hey, he's gone. So both of them together start checking a couple of the rooms. But then they hear Jericho crying and they rush to the nursery. And Jericho is on the floor. And that's when Julian notices that in the crib is George sleeping, a grown man in a baby crib. This guy walked in, took Julian out, put him on the floor and climbed in. And right away, Julian says, that's it. I'm kicking this guy out. But Dorothy begs him not to because she's worried that if they kick George out, they're going to lose Leanne forever. And Julian could not care less about that because this is weird as hell. But Dorothy tells him that not everybody is as normal as them. Just let it go. And she takes Jericho into bed with her, but does ask Julian, can you stay in here and make sure that he doesn't move? Although Julian falls asleep and when he wakes up the next morning, George is already downstairs for breakfast. And Dorothy has gone into full convinced George Leanne needs to stay mode. I mean, she is dressed up like a nun. Even embracing the whole praying thing, which catches Julian off guard. And nothing is said about the fact that this guy slept the night in the baby crib. When he goes to leave, he notices that his old shoes are gone and they're replaced with new shoes. Or slightly used shoes from Sean. Dorothy tells him that he hasn't worn them in years and she felt like George could use a new pair. So George quickly slips on into him and says, thank him for me. But then he calls for Leanne to say her goodbyes. And it's obvious that Leanne doesn't want to go and... Dorothy tries to tell him that, but he cuts her off and saying, I wasn't talking to you, woman. Dorothy then implores Leanne to tell George how she feels, and she does, saying, I want to stay. And George goes up to her, very confrontational-like, and says to her, what about the others, the ones that deserve your help? You want to abandon them for this, for her? And she says, yeah. So George says, very well then, I'll come back with your Aunt May. You know that you can't say no to her. But right before he leaves, he looks at everybody and just says, this is a godless house, which Dorothy really takes to heart. And when Sean gets home from his trip, Dorothy has just gotten off the phone with the church to baptize Jericho, and there's no talking her out of it. Sean heads upstairs to the nursery to check on Jericho, but he also notices that creepy marionette that is now hanging from the ceiling. Although upstairs, in Leanne's room, she is looking outside because George never left. He's across the street staring her down. In episode 7, Dorothy gets a visit from Natalie, the kinesiologist that actually suggested to the Turners that they get this doll to help Dorothy cope with the loss of Jericho. Natalie is doing some kind of practice, and in the middle of it, a door slams, and Dorothy jumps up startled, although it turns out it was just Leanne. But Natalie hasn't heard of Leanne. So when Dorothy explains that Leanne was hired as a nanny, she gets really concerned with the fact that the Turners hired a girl to take care of a doll. When the session eventually does wrap up, though, Dorothy thanks her, pays her a little bit of extra, and kind of fires her. But because they're friends, she does invite her over for dinner. Dorothy tries to hurry out of the house, but before she does so, she yells for Leanne to bring Jericho down so she can hug him. But Natalie is very concerned for Dorothy's well-being, saying, I think we should talk about this. But it doesn't matter anyway because Leanne doesn't bring Jericho down, and Dorothy's Uber is waiting outside. So Natalie is in the house by herself with Leanne, and she's waiting for Sean to come home to help her with the kinesiology table. And she decides to go take a look in Jericho's room. But right before she actually gets to the crib to see what Jericho has, you know, become... Leanne comes out of nowhere, attacks her, grabs Jericho, and runs and locks herself in her bedroom. And as Natalie is trying to get upstairs to see what's going on, having just been attacked, Sean arrives, wondering why Natalie is racing up the steps. Natalie fills Sean in on how she was attacked by Leanne, but Sean's big concern is he doesn't know what Dorothy told Natalie. So you can imagine his relief when she says, you really hired a nanny to take care of a doll? I mean, this is delusional. This was never supposed to go on this long. You're doing real harm here. Sean tells her, I think I know what's best for my wife. But Natalie says, I don't think you do. I think you're using that doll as an emotional crush, just like your wife. I think you're starting to tell yourself that that's real. I mean, we did what we thought was right at the time, but this has gone too far. 
Natalie eventually leaves, and Sean is relieved because he feels like he dodged a real bullet with Natalie not finding out there's an actual human baby upstairs. But when Dorothy comes home and tells Sean that she invited Natalie over for dinner, the panic starts to come back. He tries to convince Dorothy to go out to a restaurant with her, but she doesn't want to. She wants to host, and that's an issue. The next day, when Leanne is doing some laundry, she goes over to the table to see what Sean is working on, because he clearly has, like, the insides of an animal. And he tells her that what's on the table is heart, liver, you know, all the nasty stuff. He tells Leanne that they have a guest coming over, and it's Natalie. And he explains that if she finds out about Jericho, it's all over. He can't keep a lid on that, so he needs Leanne's help. They cannot let Natalie and Dorothy alone together for more than a couple seconds. So Leanne has agreed to kind of play hostess for the night. Another person that's coming over for dinner is Julian, but he gets a call from the PI who looked into George and didn't find anything. Julian wants him to tap into the train footage, but he can't do that. And as Julian is walking in the house, unbeknownst to everybody, there's a stray dog in the back going through the trash. And this is ironically a story that Dorothy did that night on the news about how stray dogs have run rampant in Philly. But once again, nobody knows about the stray dog and Julian comes in and he hasn't come empty handed because he has $20,000 with him. Sean, meanwhile, was only able to get eight because he had to move some things around. And the money is going to be used for when they figure George comes back and tries to blackmail them. They put the money aside and Sean explains to Julian the whole Natalie situation. And when Natalie does arrive, Leanne is there to greet her. Leanne apologizes saying that there have been some home burglaries and she thought she was one of them. But Natalie's pretty short with her. She does want to know, what exactly do you do for the Turners? And Leanne plays it beautifully, saying, I do whatever's asked, and walks away. Everybody sits down for dinner. It's going to be a traditional Scottish meal. Leanne goes through what everybody's going to be eating. But right before they dig in, Dorothy starts to pray, which isn't normal. Natalie says, when did God enter this house? And Dorothy lies to her, saying that they've always been religious. They just kept their beliefs close to the vest. Sean tells Leanne to go grab some wine from the cellar. But when she does so, all of a sudden, the cellar floor gets a giant crack in it. Really startles Leanne, but she gets the wine, delivers it. And every single time that Natalie tries to bring up the subject, Sean and Julian are obviously trying to get her off the subject. It comes to a head when Julian says, you're the only person that wants this. And finally, Dorothy realizes that they're kind of having an intervention with her. Because Natalie says, Dorothy, you need to hear me. You are not well. Although, Dorothy doesn't think this has anything to do with Jericho. Dorothy thinks this has everything to do with the fact that she fired Natalie. She gives the group a verbal tongue lashing, saying she's stronger than they think. And then she walks away. And Sean isn't far behind her to check on his wife. Natalie turns to Julian and says, we have caused irreparable harm for that woman. Natalie then heads outside to find Leanne cleaning up some of that trash that that stray dog was into. And she asks Leanne, what did those guys tell you? But Leanne doesn't answer. She then tells Leanne that she was the one that everybody called because nobody knew what to do. And Leanne is pretty concerned and asks, what did they do? But the conversation gets broken up when Julian says that Dorothy wants to play a game. When the group heads back inside, the downstairs bathroom is being used, so Natalie heads upstairs. But when she does, she hears something coming from Jericho's room. She goes to investigate, and she sees the living, breathing Jericho. But then right behind him in the shadows is this stray dog. And Natalie gets scared and runs out, and it forces Julian to grab a wine bottle and kill it. And when Leanne comes into the room and sees the dead dog, she is completely shook. They drag the dog into a closet for the time being until animal control can show up. And the Turners head upstairs to tempt Jericho. Natalie and Julian head outside because Natalie has some questions. And Julian apologizes, saying that they should have told Natalie what was up beforehand. The child is Leanne's. There's some rape incest situation going on. And the Turners are thinking about making it a proper home going through the adoption process. But Natalie's big concern is the fact that Dorothy thinks that that child is Jericho. She tells Julian this isn't what Dorothy needs, but Julian snaps back and says, fuck Dorothy, what do the rest of us need? We were there too. And I guess Natalie needs to get laid because she whispers into Julian's ear, let me take care of you, and they head down to the basement and bang one out. Although as they're doing so, Julian's getting distracted because he's hearing this squeak sound coming from one of the baskets. Eventually, though, they wrap up, they head upstairs to say their goodbyes to Sean and Dorothy, saying that they're actually going to go home together, which is surprising to everybody in the room. But Natalie's coat is in the same closet with the dead dog, and when Julian goes to get the coat, that dog is suddenly alive. And when the closet door is open, it just runs out of the house. In episode 8, the Turners have a fancy dinner that they need to go to, and Toby is actually taking Leanne out on a date. It's going to force Julian to have to come over and watch Jericho for a couple hours. When Julian gets there, though, he fills Sean in on what's going on on the Natalie front. Natalie hasn't left Julian's apartment in the last three days, and she got him on this cleansing detox. But more importantly, Julian has been telling her about the whole adoption thing, and she's been buying it, although she thinks it's a terrible idea. 
As soon as everybody leaves, though, for the night, and it's just Julian, he calls up his private investigator and tells him that Leanne is going to the bowling alley and just take a look at her, see if she's talking to anybody, get in contact with anybody. He starts making himself dinner, pouring himself a bottle of wine, but he's realized that there's no sound coming from the baby monitor, and when he goes to check up on Jericho, the doll is back, and the real Jericho is gone. He frantically starts running through the entire house looking for baby Jericho, but he's coming up empty, and he's panicking. He calls up Sean, but Sean doesn't answer. And when the private investigator gets in contact with him, he's freaking out at him, yelling. Does she have a baby with her? But she doesn't. She's just bowling. Eventually, though, Sean does end up returning his call. And as the two are FaceTiming, he's telling Sean it's gone. But he needs to clean up his act because Dorothy is basically right next to Sean, and he can't let Dorothy know that something happened to Jericho. And when Dorothy asks, how's Jericho doing? He just says, quiet as a mouse. And Sean ends up hanging up on him because they need to go take their seats. He's trying to figure out what exactly he is going to do when he gets a knock at the door and hits his father. His father was looking for Dorothy, but as soon as he finds out that Dorothy isn't there, he just throws the doll aside. He's shown up because he's really concerned with the fact they're going to actually try to have a baptism for a doll. He thinks it's gone too far. And Julian reassures him that he, along with Sean, are trying to talk her out of it. His dad shows him a picture of a baby that looks like Jericho, and he tells him that for a price, this baby, who belongs to a Swedish woman, could be theirs. They simply swap out the doll for the baby and see how she reacts. If she freaks out, they take the baby away. But if she doesn't, no harm, no foul, that's now Jericho. And this whole story just causes Julian to laugh because unbeknownst to his dad, that's exactly what's happened. Although his dad takes it as Julian's laughing at him because it's a stupid idea. And right before his dad goes to leave for the night, Julian tells him, look, it's not the worst idea. It's not like we haven't thought of something similar. And Julian's dad reassures him, if we do it my way, it'll be like none of this ever happened. And then he takes off. Shortly thereafter, Julian gets a phone call from the private investigator that Leanne and Toby are headed back in. And poor Leanne goes to kiss Toby goodnight, but Toby pulls back. I don't know if he was caught off guard or he just doesn't like her like that, but Leanne took it as an insult. She comes into the house and sees the baby on the ground and picks it up and starts coddling it like it's a real child, taking it upstairs. But she gets cut off by Julian, who says, all right, where is it? But she ignores the comment, continuing to go upstairs, changing its diaper, and every single question that Julian asks her about where the real Jericho is, she's acting like he's not even asking it. Responding with things like, hey, I need more diapers, can you go grab them? The two head downstairs and Julian asks, are we waiting for your uncle? But she says, no, he should be home by now. My Aunt May, however, and he cuts her off, saying, I went to Wisconsin, I saw the gravestone for Leanne Grayson. I don't know who you are, and honestly, I don't even care at this point. I just want to talk to whoever's in charge. But once again, she just keeps ignoring it. And Julian's becoming more and more on edge. Because the Turners are going to be home in an hour, and he's wondering, what exactly is Dorothy going to find? But Leanne tells him she's going to find Jericho. Julian asks her, okay, where is the real Jericho? And once again, she repeats, he's in his crib. He's losing his patience quickly, and he yells, what do you want? But she responds with, well, what did you find? Meaning... When he came over and the incident happened, what did he see? And he gets thrown off by the question, just throwing a number at her. $100,000. But instead of accepting the offer, she says, Thank you for sitting with Jericho tonight. I think it's good that you guys got to spend some time together. And heads upstairs. He runs upstairs and grabs the doll, holding it over the banister, threatening to drop it. But Leanne says, you're not going to drop it, Julian. You don't want to cause any harm. But Julian is going to drop it, counting down from five, wanting to know exactly what happened to the real Jericho. And when Leanne doesn't tell him, he does in fact let go of the baby. But as soon as he does, for a split second, he hears a baby cry. And he frantically reaches out and is able to grab the doll. But the doll is just a doll. So he figures that the real Jericho is somewhere in the house. And he once again goes searching throughout the entire house, including grabbing a pot and banging the crap out of it to try to get this baby to wake up and cry. But no matter how hard he tries, he doesn't hear a baby cry. Eventually, he gives up and heads upstairs to find Leanne praying, and that's when he fills Leanne on everything that he found the day that Jericho died. When the Turners get home, Julian tells Sean she knows everything, and Sean is not too happy about that at all. But upstairs, Leanne is helping Dorothy take off some of her jewelry, but you can tell that the mood in the room has shifted, because Leanne is no longer calling Dorothy Dorothy, she's calling her Mrs. Turner again, and she seems to be pretty pissed off at Dorothy. Eventually, she takes off this pearl necklace, and the pearls go everywhere, and Dorothy is trying to pick them up, begging Leanne to help her. But instead of doing so, Leanne picks up one of the loose pearls that landed on the bed and swallows it, and then tells Dorothy, I think some more headed under the bed. In episode 9, we get a look into what happened in the birth of Jericho. Dorothy had him at home, all natural, water birth, no drugs, very impressive stuff. She took some time off of work, which gave her a nice little shout-out. Worth mentioning, that guy is actually a newscaster in Philly. 
the girl, not so much. But she's a new mom. She has to hire a nanny. And worst of all, Sean had to go out to California to film this cooking competition show where he was going to be a judge on it. So it left Dorothy all alone with a newborn. She could have gotten help from Julian, but she didn't feel comfortable doing so because she was pretty sure he was back on drugs. So she was just all alone, and she would watch the episodes of this cooking competition with Jericho, but she was obviously having a tough go of it. And one particular day, it's over 100 degrees in Philly. She's gone out, gotten some food, and when she gets home, she parks the car. Worth mentioning, she parks like an asshole because she really boxes the guy behind her in. There was plenty of space in front. But more importantly, she forgets to bring Jericho inside. She just goes throughout her normal routine, and it wasn't intentional because she turned on the baby monitor. But baby, hot car... Not hard to figure out what happened. And eventually, she went out and got Jericho from the car. But when she did so, she just proceeded to act like nothing wrong happened. Including when a food delivery comes to the house for Sean four days early. It's this massive slab of meat that they just left on the table. And instead of putting it away, Dorothy just left it there, coddling this dead infant. And it didn't take long for that hunk of meat to start to rot pretty quickly under the hot Philly summer. Gets pretty muggy here. When the last episode of the show airs, Dorothy is FaceTiming Sean, but Sean can tell that something isn't right. Sean just figures, though, that it's postpartum depression. But when it finally comes time for Sean to come home, he needs a ride from the airport, but Dorothy isn't answering. She's not trying to be a bitch. She's literally in a catatonic state. Julian eventually shows up, knocking on the door with nobody answering. He gets in the house using the spare key, and he was the first one, outside of Dorothy, obviously, to find Jericho dead. Now, back with present day... Dorothy is awoken really early in the morning by Leanne because the car alarm is going off. Sean has already taken off out of the house. He's gone to the fish market. So a very groggy Dorothy finds the key, turns the car alarm off, but they start having a conversation about how Leanne has helped Sean with the food. And Dorothy tells her, yeah, you can do that as long as you get everything else done. And Leanne takes that as a slap in the face, saying, what, have I not been attentive to Jericho? And it's not like Dorothy meant it that way. She's just tired and miserable, so... Leanne says, hey, I'll make you breakfast. And she goes downstairs to start making her breakfast, but Sean has arrived back from the fish market and tells her that what she's about to make, this cayenne omelet, it's not actually something Dorothy wants. She just thinks she wants it. She tells herself that she likes spicy stuff, but she doesn't actually. It messes with her stomach. So just tell her it's in there, and she'll believe it. Leanne starts to take it upstairs, but Sean stops her, telling her that what happened to Jericho isn't a crime, at least not according to the police. The police told the family that it actually happens a lot more than you think. But Leanne doesn't say anything, just saying that I need to get this food upstairs. And when she does, Dorothy is trying on swimsuits because that day's story is going to be about this local pool opening up and the producer wants her to dive into it. But Leanne gives her a backhanded compliment, saying that she looks great, but pointing out the fact that people know that she just had a baby so they won't get taken aback. It makes Dorothy pretty self-conscious. Dorothy gets ready and rushes out the door, grabbing the car keys, and Sean is yelling at her, hey, I need the car to do deliveries. But Dorothy says... Well, I need it more. And when she gets in her car, she smells something weird and she turns around and sees the fish that Sean had got from the market and projectile vomits all over the front of the car. She walks back into the house in rough shape, sick, just puking her guts out. And Sean puts the remnants of the omelet that she was eating into a Ziploc bag and puts it in the freezer. Ironically enough, putting it right next to Jericho's placenta. Sounds delicious. So Dorothy has to call out of work for that day. And as she's trying to rest, she hears the car alarm going off again. Although this time, she can't find the car keys. And she's in pajamas, she's running around the house trying to find them, and eventually she locates them, but it's not working. Every time she presses the button to turn the alarm off, nothing's happening. And it causes her, in her pajamas once again, to go out in the middle of the street trying to turn the car alarm off in front of all of these people who are staring. Some even have their phones out recording the incident. And finally, the alarm goes off, but only when Dorothy opens up the back seat which is where Jericho died. Although, as soon as she closes it, the car alarm goes back on, and it turns out that Leanne is on the third floor of the house just screwing with her. She goes back inside and is watching the story that she was supposed to do that night and the girl that replaced her. That's to do with this pool opening back up in Roxborough, which I'll tell you right now, I live in Roxborough. We don't have pools like that, so that's a lie. But when Sean comes in, she asks Sean if he needs a taste tester for the dish that he was working on, But he says, no, you're sick. So he goes and asks Leanne because he still can't taste anything. He tells Leanne that what he's prepared is blowfish. And blowfish gets a bad rap because of the fact that it's so poisonous. But if prepared correctly, it's actually delicious. He just needs to know if she likes it. Although when she puts it in her mouth, she gives a face and spits it out. She doesn't like it at all. And he says, well, try it again. I need to know why you don't like it. But instead of taking another bite, she asks, why did you stay with her? And Sean says, people make mistakes. 
Dorothy made a mistake, and Dorothy had to spend four days with that dead child because she was waiting for Sean to come home and help her with it. And Sean's mistake was the fact that he left her. Leanne takes another bite of the fish and tells Sean that it tastes like bad fruit. She then goes upstairs to find Dorothy handling Jericho, and she sort of rips Jericho away from Dorothy, which takes Dorothy aback. But she tells Dorothy, you're sick. You have a bug. You don't want Jericho to get it. And while Dorothy understands, she feels hurt because Leanne's kind of making her out to be a bad mom. In the season finale, it is finally the day of the baptism. Sean has made a bunch of food for the event, including integrating Jericho's placenta into some of the food and not telling anyone, which is super weird. Toby and Leanne were not invited to the church. They were getting everything prepared, and they will be serving the group that comes back home for the reception. And shortly after everybody arrives back, Dorothy is in the living room kind of bragging about the fact that she was able to do a natural birth. But in the middle of Dorothy patting herself on the back to this crowd, she sees a little girl walk by, which catches her eye. And then suddenly, everybody gets an amber alert on their phone. Dorothy doesn't pay any attention to it, following the girl upstairs, who is sitting on the steps. And the little girl is holding a doll. And when Dorothy tells her that's a really nice doll, the little girl says it's not a doll, it's some name that the little girl gave the doll. And the little girl gives Dorothy the doll to hold, but when she does that, Dorothy suddenly remembers holding the fake Jericho doll. She's in a little bit of a shock, and she ends up dropping this little girl's doll down the steps, but the little girl doesn't understand what's happening. She just walks down the steps, picks up the doll, and looks at Dorothy like, yo, what the hell? And then walks off. Back in the living room, however, the cameraman that had filmed the baptism puts it on the TV. But Julian, who is watching it, yells at the cameraman, yo, rewind, go back. And when he does so, there is Leanne's Uncle George, along with a female that we can only assume is Aunt May, standing across the street. And Leanne saw it too. So Julian heads out and calls his private investigator, telling him that they saw Uncle George, but it was on camera, so if you see him, take him out. And as Leanne is watching from afar Julian talk to the PI, Natalie comes over and says, hey, I might as well play the game. Can I hold the baby? Where is he? But when she goes outside to get Jericho, she can't find him. And she's kind of freaking out a little bit. She runs up to his crib where there's a woman holding Jericho, and it's Leanne's Aunt May. Downstairs, however, in the cellar, Sean is going downstairs to get some champagne when Uncle George shows up, and immediately Sean knows who he is. He goes to get some money and tries to pay him off with six grand, but Uncle George doesn't want that. So Sean yells at him, what do you want? If you don't want money, do you want Leanne? Do you want the baby? But George starts to explain the backstory of where Leanne came from, saying that when the fire happened in Wisconsin, everyone just believed that Leanne was dead, and it was just easier to make everybody think that. George and May brought Leanne to PA and raised her. He tells Sean, your wife wouldn't remember meeting Leanne. It happened so long ago, but Leanne never stopped talking about it. How beautiful Dorothy was and how nice she was to her. And it definitely helped that every single night on the news, it was like Dorothy was telling her stories and tucking her in. He goes on to explain how Leanne likes to help the people that she likes and hurt the people that she doesn't. And he fears that Leanne has done something that can't really be easily put back together. But Sean tells him, I just want to know whose child this is. And George tells him, you know the answer to that. But Sean doesn't. And George yells at him, well, if it wasn't your child, why did you keep it? And Sean explains that it was for Dorothy because she needed it. But George gets up and asks him, well, what did Sean need? What's going to mend Sean? What wounds do you have? What has she done to you? And Sean realizes it's the splinters and the fact that ever since she arrived, he hasn't been able to taste any food. And George has Sean's hands clasped and he's gotten on his knees in kind of a praying formation. And Julian comes in and sees it, but Sean tells him to stay back because he's cool with what's going on. George tells Sean, ask him, ask and you shall receive. What do you want? And Sean says, I want Jericho to stay. I want my son back. And this is a big moment for Sean, who seems to be buying into all of this. But back upstairs in Jericho's nursery, May can tell that something has happened to Leanne. It doesn't seem like Leanne is infatuated with Dorothy anymore. And she asks her, what did she do? And Leanne fills her in on everything that happened, but says it was a mistake. It wasn't baby Jericho's time to go. But May tells her that God had a plan for that baby, and you thought you knew better. May tells Leanne that Dorothy will hurt that baby again, and she will hurt you. But Leanne feels that the Turners deserve a second chance, and if she can do that for him, she's going to. But May feels like the house has changed Leanne. Dorothy shows up, though, because she needs to bring Jericho downstairs, and she's surprised to see this random woman in Jericho's nursery. And Leanne introduces the two, saying, this is my Aunt May. May thanks Dorothy for all the kindness that the Turners have shown to Leanne, but she says, of course, she's like a member of the family now. She does take Jericho down because her dad is going to make a speech. Her dad doesn't really care where this baby came from because Dorothy seems to be in a really good state. But when she does take him down, May turns to Leanne and says, come home. 
both of you. But Leanne is really concerned with what would happen to Dorothy if she did that. And May says she would wake up tomorrow and you'd both be gone. No more dolls. No more pretending. It'll be as everything was meant to be. Besides, you're our servant, not hers. But everybody heads downstairs to do the toast. Sean ends up cutting open a bottle of champagne. But as soon as he does that and hands the bottle over to Toby, he goes over to George saying, okay, that's it. He's ours now for life. But George gives him some religious mumbo jumbo that Sean doesn't really understand. And before Sean can get an answer as to what it means, Toby comes over and hands him the broken bottleneck, saying that it's good luck and to give it to Jericho on his 21st birthday. Dorothy, meanwhile, walks up to Aunt May and says, have we not met before? But May says, oh, no, Dorothy, we've never met. That's impossible. I would have remembered you. But then there's a knock at the door from the Philadelphia Police Department. They've gotten the address and think that there's a missing child in the house. And Sean gets a pit in his stomach. He is crushing this broken bottleneck in his palm. Turns out, though, this had nothing to do with baby Jericho. It had to do with that little girl and the doll from the steps. The police figured that she saw the procession going from the church and just followed everybody home. But Sean's hand is pretty cut up, and when he goes to clean it, he realized that he can't feel anything. There's no pain. So he can't taste, and now he can't feel pain, and he figures Leanne has got to be doing this to him, but Julian says, do not let her get inside your head. And while that was going on, Leanne was in her bedroom looking outside because Aunt May and Uncle George haven't left. They're across the street just staring at her. Eventually, though, everybody leaves, and the last ones to do so are Julian and Natalie. And Sean tells Julian that he prayed for Jericho to come back. And he doesn't know how, but he knows that the kid up in that nursery is his son. He knows that somehow Leanne brought his son back to him. But Julian doesn't really give into that conversation, telling him that he's paid the private investigator to stay on the block and just keep an eye on things. He doesn't expect anything to happen, but just in case. And after Natalie and Julian leave, Sean heads back upstairs, and both Sean and Dorothy tuck Jericho in for the night. Although, unfortunately for that private investigator, something does happen. While sitting in his car, he looks up and sees Aunt May standing in the street pretty close to his car. And when he gets out to see if she's all right, Uncle George is behind him. And when Toby leaves shortly after, Toby walks by the private investigator's car where the door is open, but no one's around. Toby really doesn't think anything of it, and just keeps walking home. Later that night, though, Sean goes downstairs to test out this whole I can't feel pain anymore situation, putting his hand over an open flame on the burner. But the closer he gets, he still cannot feel pain. Dorothy, though, is getting ready for bed when something jogs her memory, and she rushes downstairs and starts putting in old news footage that she did. And there's one story from Wilmington, Delaware, where there was a standoff with the police and a cult called the Church of the Lesser Saints. There were reports of gunshots and... At the time, there was thought to be about 12 people in this compound, half of which were children. And the compound was led by Aunt May. And when Dorothy sees that, she goes upstairs to talk to Leanne, but Leanne is gone. All of her stuff is packed. She's left. She rushes to Jericho's nursery, and when she opens the door, a flashback hits her of the police taking Jericho's dead body out of the crib. And when she walks over to the crib, the living, breathing Jericho is gone, and it is replaced by that doll. So the big question is, what happened to Leanne? Well, Leanne walked outside, where in the middle of the street were about 30 people waiting for her. And as she made her way through them, right at the front was Uncle George and Aunt May. And all these people have a group hug in the middle of this residential street. A cop even drives by it and sees it. And when he backs up his patrol car, though, everybody is gone. Season 2 picks up right where Season 1 left off, with Dorothy finding the doll in the crib and then frantically searching for Jericho all over the house. She goes downstairs where Sean is still burning his hand, feeling no sensation whatsoever, and asks him, do you have Jericho? And when he says no, then the panic really sets in. She runs outside looking for any sign of Leanne, who also isn't in the house, but doesn't find any. When she comes back in, she calls the police, and that's when Sean comes into the room and asks, who are you calling? And she says, the police. Who else would I call? Don't just stand there. Do something. And boy, does he ever. He runs around the house and tears down any sign whatsoever that there was a baby shower in there. He grabs every gift, pops every balloon, and has it set so when the cops do show up, he can play it off like there is no baby. And that works because when the cops show up, Dorothy starts showing them old news footage that she took about the Church of the Lesser Saints where allegedly Aunt May died. Or at least she was thought to be dead in that explosion. So when she starts telling the cops that this woman was in my house, they're saying, hold the phone. You mean to tell me that the dead lady took your child? And that does sound pretty bad. The more that they have trouble understanding, the more irritated Dorothy is getting. Sean, meanwhile, is upstairs just staring at the doll in the crib, shocked. And that's when a police officer named Officer Reyes pops in. Reyes' shift was about to end, but then she got the call and recognized the house number because Officer Reyes was the police officer that showed up when they eventually called the police about the first Jericho dying. 
Sean explains the doll how it's not real, it's Dorothy's, and then the two head downstairs where Dorothy is berating the police officers about how they need to set up roadblocks. She looks to Sean for reassurance about this whole thing because she's coming off as crazy, but Sean doesn't give her any. He doesn't say a word. Dorothy clearly needs a break, and she gets pulled into another room away from the cops, and that's when Julian and Natalie show up. Natalie heads off to find Dorothy, and Julian tells her, drug her if you have to. And then Julian and Sean go in a separate room so they can speak privately. Sean says, I don't know what happened. I don't know if the uncle took him, but yeah, the baby's gone. And Julian's feeling is, good, let him. Sean's freaking out a little bit. He says to Julian that Dorothy's up there telling them everything. And even though she hasn't been right since the accident, she's not crazy. But Julian's feeling is that they have to protect themselves. He tells Sean, I briefed Natalie in the car. Deny, there is no baby. But Sean looks at him like he's crazy, saying, we just dunked him in holy water. People were there. They saw it. And Julian says, yeah, that's even more reason to get the cops out of here before they start poking around. While Julian and Sean argue downstairs, upstairs, Natalie pulls Officer Reyes aside and tells her that Dorothy just hasn't been doing great, implying that she's concocted the baby and also Leanne. It's a pretty damning look because in the other room, Dorothy is frantically trying to find the resume of Leanne Grayson, but she's coming up empty. Later on, Julian tries to do his part. He sees Officer Reyes looking at the baby, walks in the nursery and says, you know, we'll never understand what they go through. You never recover from something like that. Although he looks visibly worried that Reyes is going to be on to his bullshit. But when she gets the call about an update, she just says, false alarm. She does, though, look at Julian and say, I hope you guys know what you're doing. And then she takes off. Later that night, after the cops have gone, Julian shows Sean the videotape from the baptism that he saw that shows in the background Uncle George and Aunt May. And Sean's a little freaked out because this is the first time he's seen this video. Julian says, well, the good news is they're gone now. But Sean's big concern is, who were these people and what the hell did they want with them? Natalie then walks in the room, having just slipped Dorothy some melatonin so she could sleep. And she asks to get filled in on exactly who Aunt May is. After Sean does fill her in, she says, you know, I agree with Julian. Maybe this is an opportunity for everybody to move forward. I mean, Dorothy's up there grieving the wrong child. But Sean screams at her, he's not dead. We were giving him a loving home. We were taking care of him. But Natalie cuts him off and says he was never yours to keep. The problem is Sean truly believes that that baby, whoever he was, belonged to the Turners. Sean heads upstairs the next morning and finds Dorothy sleeping on the couch. But on the TV, she had found a YouTube video of some kids pranking Aunt May. And it was Aunt May in a mall giving out pamphlets clear as day. Now, when Dorothy does eventually wake up, she goes into Leanne's room looking for anything, really, when she sees something coming out of the wall. So she starts tearing the wall up. And Sean ends up coming upstairs hearing all the commotion. And that's when Dorothy finds the wire that he put in there to spy on Leanne. Now, at first, he's like, oh, shit, thinking that the jig is up, he's going to get caught because that is pretty damning. But to his surprise, Dorothy doesn't take it like my husband put it there. Dorothy takes it as these people were spying on us the entire time. And instead of trying to explain himself and correct her, Sean just goes along with that lie. Sean then heads into the bathroom to check on his hand, and his hand is all blistered up. He starts cutting open the pus pockets, but he's still not feeling anything. He rewraps the bandages and walks into Dorothy's office where she has printed out Have You Seen This Woman posters for Aunt May. She wants to canvas the area because it's the utmost importance that they get as much information as possible in the first 48 hours. After 48 hours, your likelihood of finding a lost child go down drastically. So she prints out a bunch of these flyers and gives them to Sean to canvas the area, but he just walks outside and tosses them in the trash. When Sean eventually comes back, Dorothy is once again watching old news footage, where it's the aftermath of the explosion at the Church of the Lesser Saints. And a lot of people surprisingly showed up to mourn the losses. She interviews one guy who says that he recognized one of the victims on television as somebody who revived his daughter after she got hit by a car. It's a story, though, that Dorothy isn't buying. She's not believing that anyone in that cult revived anybody. Sean then heads upstairs looking to see if he can find anything in Leanne's bedroom. And he finds, you know, a strand of hair... Nothing of significance, though, until he looks under the bed and finds that she left her Bible. He starts flipping through it and notices that she had written the name Sean in one of the margins. And at the top, it says the test of leprosy, although I'm not sure if any of his symptoms actually go with leprosy or not. But yeah, it's not it's not good. Sean, though, shakes that off and heads downstairs to try to feed Dorothy. But she's not interested in food at the moment. She's still trying to find more information about Aunt May. The problem is the trail went cold seven years ago when the church exploded. Dorothy's thing is that somebody must have seen her. Somebody must have known where she was this entire time. And that's when she finally notices that Sean's hand is all bandaged up. He tells her it's fine. And as soon as he says that, she moves back to Aunt May, saying that she could have changed her identity. The next day, Julian stops by. And right before they get into the crux of the issue, 
Sean says, hey, have you heard from Roscoe? Because pretty sure his car is still out front. Roscoe being the P.I. And Julian tells him, no, but in all honesty, he's not the most reliable. Just because I haven't heard from him doesn't mean that they have him. It also, though, doesn't mean that he is still trailing them. Sean seems to think it's a big deal, but Julian doesn't. Sean called Julian over, though, for information about the Church of the Lesser Saints. He needs to find these people. But Julian came up empty, just like Dorothy, saying the trail's cold. And that's not exactly what Sean wanted to hear. He tells Julian, well, we gotta find these people before Dorothy involves the entire neighborhood in on this. She's not gonna stop looking for them, not while they have Jericho. And Julian kind of looks at him cross-eyed and says, I'm sorry, who? And that's when Sean corrects himself and says, the baby. After this conversation, Julian heads upstairs to see how his sister's doing, and she has turned that office into a full-on research center looking for these people. She's also switched her Have You Seen posters from Aunt May to Leanne. She feels like Aunt May is too smart. She's been able to cover her tracks. Leanne, though, is just an innocent 18-year-old girl. They probably have more luck finding information on Leanne than they do Aunt May. She gives Julian the posters this time to go canvas the neighborhood, but before he goes outside, he stops in Jericho's nursery. He grabs one of Jericho's shoes and then also grabs the Jericho doll. And when he gets outside, he tosses the posters and the doll in the trash. Of course, Sean and Dorothy have no idea he just did this. Later that night, when Sean comes downstairs, Dorothy has put up a diagram figuring out how far they possibly could have gotten and how far the police currently have to search for Jericho. This leads to a really big fight with the two, with Dorothy telling Sean that she thought he would be a better father, and Sean snapping back at her, coming really close to saying, yeah, well, I trusted you not to kill him, but he catches himself, simply saying, what would you do if he was dead? And Dorothy admits that if he was dead, she would end up committing suicide to be with him. This argument, though, is broken up when an alarm goes off, and the alarm was there to signify that it's been 48 hours since Jericho is missing, and now the likelihood of ever finding him has just gone in the toilet. Dorothy breaks down, and Sean consoles her. They then get a knock at the door, though, but when Dorothy goes and opens it, no one's there, but someone has left a manila envelope. When she opens it, Jericho's shoe is in the envelope along with a note that says, Tell no one baby lives. It was obviously put there by Julian, but Dorothy doesn't know that, and it gives her hope for the moment. The next day, though, is trash day in Philadelphia, and to the surprise of many Philadelphia residents, they picked it up on time. As Sean wheels the cans out, the trash men dump it in the trash truck, and that's when Sean notices that the doll was in there. And he didn't put it in there. And instead of letting the trash truck take the doll away, Sean grabs it, takes it upstairs, and starts giving it a bath as if it were a real child. Even though at the end of episode one, Dorothy got a little bit of hope, a couple days later, the hope is gone. She's in a bad spot. Julian is actually staying over just to kind of be there for his sister. But he's staying in the same room that Leanne stayed in. And when he wakes up one day, he's a little creeped out, especially when he goes in the bathroom and someone has drawn a bath. He goes into Dorothy's office to see if she was the one who did it, but it's clear that she didn't. Because she is just laying on the couch, watching home movies of herself with Jericho, who is nonstop crying. In fact, the only time that he stops crying is when Leanne holds him. Julian, in fact, has to calm her down because she's focused on what these people might be doing to Jericho. The doorbell then rings, and when she goes downstairs, she's received a package. She assumes that it's from the people that took Jericho, but it's not. It's actually a present that Julian got for the baby for the baptism, little spaceman suit. She tells Julian how her stomach hurts and it must be because of Jericho, but he says no. It's because you haven't eaten in a bunch of days. You're assuming the worst, but he might be laughing. I mean, there's no way for you to actually know what he's up to. And that really upsets Dorothy who looks at him and says, you don't believe in anything. You never did. You know what you are? You're an atheist. And then she just heads upstairs, but damn it, Julian paid for that spaceman suit, it's going on a baby, he sees the doll there, and he dresses it up in it. Julian then heads in the kitchen where Sean is making Dorothy some French toast just to cheer her up, although he does think that everything he's doing lately is just making things worse. Luckily for everybody in the house, Julian has another genius plan, a ransom. He asks Sean how much money he has and how much money they should ask for because he feels like his sister needs a little bit more hope but Sean thinks that's absurd. Giving her hope through a fake ransom isn't the way to do things. Julian then notices that Sean is burning the caramel that he's cooking, so Julian lets him tend to that, but upstairs, Dorothy isn't doing a real great job of taking her mind off things. She's found a YouTube video where the Church of the Lesser Saints are going through some sort of ritual 
They're all sitting in a barn as a guy naked is whipping himself, just like Leanne did in their own home. But she has to put the iPad down when she gets a phone call, and it's from work. They want her back on the news desk because she has to fill in. And when Julian finds out, he thinks this is a terrible idea. He warns her, yeah, but what about Jericho? And she shoots back, I'm doing this for Jericho. Julian tries to enlist Sean's help, but while Sean is a little worried about his wife going on TV, he's willing also to let her get out of the house and go to work. And Dorothy's whole thing is, well, if they're watching the news, then it'll give Jericho a little mommy time. Before she leaves, she asks Sean to tape the news, and she heads off. And one of the reasons that Sean was cool with letting her go is because Roscoe has shown up. He woke up outside in the car, and when he had trouble finding his keys, he went in the house. The problem is, Roscoe thinks it's Monday, and it's actually Friday. He can't account for where he's been. And that is really freaking out both Sean and Julian, because Roscoe is dead set on saying, no, it's Monday, I was outside in the car the whole time, when he really wasn't. And you can imagine being gone for four days, he is famished. He is inhaling food. And when they finally show him his phone, his first thing is he's got to get in touch with his family because they're going to be worried sick about him. Sean asks him, what's the last thing you remember? And he says, there was some lady in the street outside, thought she needed help. I got out. That was it. Julian then grabs Roscoe's cell phone because he had a bunch of pictures from his pocket, but he also has about a 12 second video. And in that video, you can hear Roscoe pleading with these people to let him go. But you can also hear a voice in the background that kind of sounds like Leanne telling him that there's no need to be scared. They're there to help him. Roscoe is crying his eyes out in this video, and Sean says, why is he crying like that? And Julian says, well, they're breaking him. It's what cults do. They start questioning Roscoe because he was clearly with these people, but he doesn't remember any of it. He just woke up. And after a very quick interrogation, it becomes obvious that Roscoe isn't holding back. He literally doesn't remember. He was either brainwashed or drugged or something. And what they need to do is unlock that memory. It's in there somewhere. And even Roscoe wants to know what the hell happened the last four days. And there's one person that can actually do that. Natalie. So she comes over, Sean explains the situation, and she agrees to help. Hypnotizing Roscoe, and then once he is, that's when they start asking the questions. Sean asks him, where were you? And Roscoe starts mumbling how they took him to a room, they won't turn on the lights, and they tied him up. He says how they never left, and there was a smell, a rotting smell. Sean then asks him, well, what do you see? What do you hear? And Roscoe fights the words, but he does end up mumbling, he's behind the door. And Natalie can tell that Roscoe's in a fragile state, so she reminds him, hey, you're in a safe space here. But Sean, wanting answers, yells, no, he's not. Go back. Who's behind the door? And Roscoe just starts yelling, knees, knees, knees. They're on their knees, bowing down to him. And his hand is a hook. Sean starts asking, well, did you see a baby? And Roscoe says, crying. The baby is crying. And at this point, Roscoe himself is crying. I can't stress enough how much Roscoe is fighting telling this whole story, but he says that the baby was being passed forward until finally this guy with the hook was holding the baby. And Sean is screaming, well, what was he doing with the baby? And that's when Roscoe says the most troubling thing of all. He takes out the eyes and he throws them away. And everybody in the room is freaked out, including Julian, who is actually holding back tears of his own. And that's when Natalie snaps Roscoe out of it. But Roscoe is freaked out because of the fact that he blocked all of that out. And Julian, who is in a state of denial, thinks that he was just drugged. He didn't see any of it. But Natalie's pretty convinced that that all was true. Afterwards, though, Natalie wants to talk to Julian because of the way he acted. She understands why Sean acted the way he did because of this fake Jericho. But she wants to know why Julian was upset. And he claims that it's for Dorothy, but Natalie isn't buying that. She asks him, do you miss him too? And he says, no, Jericho's dead. But she says, not him, the other one. He doesn't really answer the question, though, just talking about how when he was a kid, he wanted to go in a deep, deep space. And Natalie says, you know, I really want to help you. I mean, I've tried everything. And Julian says, nothing helps. But she shoots back, you don't allow it to help. She tells him, you have to believe in something, no matter how stupid it sounds. And this is now the second time in a day that Julian's heard that he doesn't believe in anything. And while those two were chatting in the kitchen, Sean was helping Roscoe out. He thanks Roscoe for going through that whole ordeal. And then Roscoe finds his keys in a pocket that he never uses. And then he heads home. Now, Sean did as he was told. He taped the news coverage that night. But Dorothy is weird as hell. First of all, she's not looking into the main camera. She's doing the news extremely slow and very creepy. And when it ends, she kind of hijacks it, putting a plea out to Leanne that if anyone knows where she is, to please contact her at the station. And when she gets home... She tells Sean, yeah, I don't think they're going to have me on the desk again. But Sean says, you did what any mother would do. 
She then goes upstairs, though, to take a shower, and in the middle of it, the water just stops. She calls down to Sean, but Sean is a little busy because while she was in the shower, she got a phone call from an unknown number, and Sean just answered it, and it was Leanne. Leanne asked Sean, why is she looking for me? Sean asks, where are you, Leanne? But Leanne asks him, why haven't you told her what she did? And downstairs, in those cracks that formed in the cellar when Leanne went down there to get some wine a couple of weeks ago, this murky liquid starts forming. In the third episode, we get more backstory on Dorothy's pregnancy with Jericho. She was actually bedridden for the last month. She was told by her doctor that if she actually just got up and walked around, she would be forced to come into the hospital. She really didn't want to do that. And boy, did she milk that bedridden excuse. She was really taking advantage of Sean. One day, however, an alarm goes off in the house, and she calls up the alarm company to see if they can turn it off, but they can't. And it forces Dorothy to actually get up out of bed and go downstairs. But as she's doing so, she ends up slipping. She's concerned at first, but she dusts herself off and goes downstairs to find a towel had been left too close to the stove and it caught on fire while Sean was out. She takes care of the issue with Sean walking in, wondering why she didn't yell for him. She did. And you can tell that she really is pissed off at Sean for making her get out of bed. Now, present day, the Turners have gotten flooded with tips on where Leanne might be but they've come up empty on just about all of them. It's been Sean who's been forced to go out and check on these tips, but she's also sent Julian to a couple of them, one of them being out in Westchester, which is about an hour away from the city. And when Julian gets there, this place is a mansion. It's huge. He can't even knock on the door because you have to get buzzed into the gate. And the size of this house has really piqued their interest. They're wondering why somebody needs all that space and all that security. And after a quick Google search, Dorothy finds out that it's a couple that owns a tech company. But she still believes there's way more to this story. And as Julian is outside, somebody comes to the front gate, but it's just a pizza delivery guy dropping off a flyer. So Julian heads back, but something about this house is just sticking with Dorothy. And that night she's discussing it with Sean, but he's being a little dismissive and she's getting really angry about that. So Sean tells her, all right, say you're right. And we burst on in there. What exactly do you think is going to happen with Jericho? And Dorothy comes around to his line of thinking. He does tell her that tomorrow I'll go and check out this house. And he does that. And as he's doing so, a grocery delivery truck leaves, indicating that the people are, in fact, there. And not only are they there, they have a lot of mouths to feed. So Dorothy, Julian, and Sean devise a plan to get in there by coming up with a fake pizza business called Jesus Christ. Because they also found out that these people are involved in the local church. You know, and it is a creative name. I'll give Julian that. And they go through a lot of effort into making this front look legit. Using the pizza oven out back, Sean makes a ton of pizzas takes pictures of all of them, makes a website, and prints out a very professional-looking flyer with very affordable pricing for what looks like amazing pizza. And they send Julian up to Westchester to drop the flyers off in the neighborhood. And then they wait. And it takes a little bit, but they finally get an order from the house they want to. And the order is for 20 pizzas. So as Sean is preparing the pizzas, Dorothy calls up Julian, and he rushes over from the opera looking ridiculous. And both Dorothy and Sean say, you can't deliver pizzas dressed like that. They're going to know something's up. So they decide to send Toby instead. So they put the pizzas in Toby's car and tell him that when he arrives to FaceTime them with his phone, but hide it a little bit. Don't make it so obvious. And as Julian and Sean are watching Toby drive off, Julian says to Sean, what do we do exactly if she is in there? And Sean tells him, no matter what, we have to keep Dorothy here. So as they're waiting for Toby to arrive at the house, Julian heads down in the basement to grab a bottle of wine. And that's when you find out what they've done about that leaking floor. They've had to dig it up. The water has done immense damage. But to get over to the wine cellar, they've put a wooden plank that they've just been walking back and forth on. And as Julian is walking back to the steps, he actually slips on it and drops the wine bottle in this murky sludge pit. So he bends over, grabs the wine, and heads back upstairs, not thinking anything of it. And at this point, Toby has arrived. And after being buzzed in, Leanne doesn't come to the door to grab pizzas, but a bunch of kids do for a soccer team. It looks like nothing more than a pizza party, and Sean thinks, all right, that's that. But the kids tell Toby that if he wants to get paid, he has to head upstairs to get the money. And as he does so, he turns a corner, and there, right in front of him, is Leanne Grayson, wondering what the hell he's doing there. And since Toby hasn't been filled in on this little mission, he's thrown off too. Now, Dorothy is back at the house screaming at him to follow her, but Toby can't hear her because she's on mute. So he heads into the next bedroom to grab the money where he finds a woman dying of cancer or something. She's bedridden, and she gives Toby the money, and he heads out. And Dorothy grabs her coat because she's planning on driving up to Westchester and grabbing Leanne. But Sean has to stop her, saying, no, we can't do this. It's clear. She found a new family. That's it. 
But the good news is we found her, so now we have to strategize. We need a plan, but we also have to be cautious because we have to bring Jericho home safe, and we need her to do that. So Sean has seemingly talked Dorothy off the ledge a little bit. Now, inside, Julian is talking to Toby, who feels betrayed a little bit that he was used just to spy on Leanne. But Julian tells him to suck it up, and he hangs up on him. And as soon as he does, the pizza business gets another order, and this time it's from Leanne for one pizza. So Dorothy heads to the kitchen and insists that she make this pizza herself. And Sean backs up saying, look, if you want to be involved, go ahead. And Sean can tell that something's up with Julian. And he says, are you all right, man? You don't look so good. How's Natalie doing? And Julian freaks out at him, demanding to know why everyone's asking about Natalie. And then he admits he has no idea how Natalie's doing. So it doesn't seem like that relationship's going too well. But they fire up the pizza. They give it to Toby to get back in the car and go deliver it. And then they wait for him to turn on the camera. And when he gets there, he gives the pizza to Leanne and she admits that she ordered it because she wanted to say goodbye to Toby. Because initially, she thought he was there to talk her into leaving. She tells him that she had to go. She didn't have a choice. And Toby asks her, did something happen with the Turners? And she says, it was Dorothy. I couldn't live with her for another day. She's not like she is on TV. She's selfish. She's cruel. She's mean. Mrs. Marino treats me really well here. And Toby says, well, what about Jericho? I'm sure he misses you. But Leanne quickly tries to change the subject begging him not to tell the Turners where she is. But Toby kind of admits that they're the ones who sent him. And she gets upset, but when she gets up, she feels really lightheaded, and then she just faints. And Toby's freaking out a little bit, not knowing what to do. And that's when Dorothy takes herself off mute. Toby's freaking out, saying, I have to call the police. But Dorothy points out that's going to be a really bad look. It's going to look like the pizza delivery guy brought this young girl pizza and drugged her. And unfortunately, Toby knows that she's right. So Dorothy tells him, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick her up, put her back in your car, and drive her back here. And if you don't, I'm going to call the police on you myself. And then she hangs up. In episode four, Toby ended up doing what he was told. He dragged Leanne back to the Turner residence. And the Turners have put her up in their attic, locked away. With Dorothy waking her up with food, but Leanne's confused. She's disoriented. She has no idea how she got there. And Dorothy fills her in that it was Toby who was the one who brought her there and then asks her, where's Jericho? But Leanne says, I don't know. And Dorothy tells her, all right, well, then you'll stay here until you remember. When she heads downstairs, Sean is a bit concerned. He asks Dorothy, what is she going to do if she has to go to the bathroom? But Dorothy was really nice. She left a bucket and some toilet paper. Pitch is crazy. She tells Sean that he needs to be on board with this because it'll only work if they're united. She's taking the same precautions that people take when you're trying to get somebody off drugs. Isolate them, break them down, make them realize that they don't know what's best. The way that Dorothy sees it, heroin and religion are pretty much the same thing. She reminds Sean that Leanne has been under the influence of a cult for pretty much her entire life. And because of that, she's probably pretty loyal to them. So they need to break that bond in order to get Leanne to tell them where Jericho is. Right before she leaves for work, Dorothy tells Sean, you can't go up there without me. She'll manipulate you because you're not as strong as you like to think. And as she's heading out, the people that are going to fix the floor in the basement have arrived. And as they're digging up the basement floor to try to fix that pipe that burst or broke or whatever, Sean is rummaging through the house looking for a key to the upstairs attic because he does want to see Leanne. Unfortunately, every key that he finds doesn't work. So he calls over Julian to discuss it, and Julian thinks that this is nuts. Julian says to Sean, you know, she could be telling Dorothy anything. And Sean says, you don't think I know that? I can't get to her. If I could talk to her, maybe I could reason with her and she would tell me where Jericho is. She's not going to help Dorothy. You heard what she said to Toby about her. When Dorothy gets home from work that day, she brings up more food for Leanne and kind of scolds her for moving around some of the items in the attic. And then Leanne tells her that, The family that she was staying with, the mother was really sick. Because of that, the family needs her. She tells Dorothy, I made a commitment to them, but Dorothy reminds her, yeah, you made a commitment to us too. You signed a contract. She tells Dorothy, though, I can't give Jericho to you. And Dorothy says, fine, then tell me where he is, but Leanne doesn't say anything. She heads downstairs to have dinner with Sean, and she just can't believe that Leanne is acting like this, but Sean reminds her, well, we never had her locked up in an attic before pissing in a bucket. And Dorothy, whose mind is so warped, thinks that that has nothing to do with it. It has to do with the fact that she's not with her cult. Sean suggests that maybe they bring her down for a little bit in the evening, but Dorothy's not willing to do that until Leanne tells them where Jericho is. Everybody goes to bed that night, and at 2 a.m., Dorothy wakes up and starts massaging Leanne's hand, and it freaks Leanne the hell out. Dorothy tells Leanne you need to bring him back, but Leanne tells her, I told you already. I can't. And then Dorothy starts really squeezing Leanne's hand, and Leanne is begging her to stop because it's starting to hurt, and Dorothy just screams at her, I need him back. When she wakes up the next morning, her back is hurting, she just thinks it's from doing her indoor skydiving segment on the news the day before, but then she goes to grab breakfast from Sean to bring it up to Leanne, and Sean suggests, hey, maybe I bring it up to her. Maybe she said something to me that she won't say to you. 
but Dorothy is not about to break the, quote, strategy that they have. So she brings the food up to Leanne, and Leanne at this point is kind of hiding from her. She starts to try to make small talk with Leanne about eating breakfast as a kid, but after that little episode at 2 a.m., Leanne's not really in a speaking mood. She finally does break her silence, though, and tells Dorothy, I want to talk to Sean, but Dorothy says, whatever you say to him, you can say to me. But Leanne just stays quiet, and Dorothy gets frustrated, but right before she leaves, she tells Leanne, you're not going to get between us. Me and Sean are a family, something you clearly never had. And then she heads off to work. And while at work, Sean, in the basement, is able to find a key to the attic. So he heads up there where Leanne is still in the corner, and he starts making a conversation with her about the mannequin that is in the attic that Leanne is kind of dressed up. The Turners called her Angela. She was in their apartment back in Rittenhouse until they moved into this new place. And after the mannequin talk, Sean tells her, I didn't know that Dorothy was going to do that. Leanne asks him, why haven't you told her what she's done? And Sean says, you don't know what it would do to Dorothy. If anybody wants to punish her, they can, because it wouldn't compare to what she would do to herself. Although Leanne's feeling is, Dorothy has what's coming to her. Sean begs Leanne, tell me where he is. I'll give you anything you want. And Leanne's one request is to use the bathroom. She takes a shower, and as she's getting out, she notices that there are scissors on the sink next to a bunch of bloody gauze from Sean's hand. When she walks out, we don't know if she has the scissors with her, but she does ask Sean what happened to his hand, and he says it was an accident. Although, truth be told, he still can't feel it. When she finally goes back to the attic, though, Sean has given her another present. It's her Bible back. Of course, Dorothy doesn't know any of this. And she comes home and waits until 2 a.m. again. This time, she's not as nice. She drags Leanne by the hair over in the corner demanding to know where Jericho is, but Leanne doesn't say anything because she's gasping for air. And then like a psychopath, Dorothy then just casually gets back into bed. When she gets up the next morning, Sean asks her, did you sleep okay? And she says, "Ah, I get panicky at 2 a.m. Yeah, that's one way to put it. She admits, though, that it seems like her body is remembering something that her mind forgot. And the weirdest part is the fact that it's always at 2 a.m. She's also pretty convinced that whatever this feeling is, it has to do with Jericho. Sean suggests that maybe they talk to Natalie to get her to prescribe or something, but Dorothy isn't about to get all pilled up. She then takes up Leanne's breakfast in the morning, and Leanne tells her, you know, I used to pray for you, but not anymore. And Dorothy snaps back at her that it's actually a good thing because they don't allow, quote, superstition in the house anymore. She drops off the food, but before leaving, she yells at Leanne that she can make this stop anytime she wants. She then takes off for work, and when she does, Sean makes Leanne a proper meal. And for whatever reason, as she's eating this bougie meal, Sean starts to tell her about the struggles that they had to even have Jericho. And Leanne knows that he's doing it so that maybe Leanne will start to feel bad for Dorothy. And Sean admits, I'll tell you whatever you want to hear as long as it means we can get him back. And Leanne asks, who? Sean kind of looks at her and says, well, Jericho. And Leanne reminds him, Jericho's dead. That night, as Sean is making food, Julian comes over and slips something in the sauce to help Dorothy calm the hell down. Sean then tells Julian, we can't let this go on much longer. Leanne is terrified up there. And she's not saying anything, and she probably won't, not as long as she's a prisoner. Julian tells Sean, you know, we're not the bad guys here. But Sean says, oh, we're not? Then what are we? And Julian says, we're the victims. But it doesn't seem like Sean really agrees with that. And as Sean is discussing this with Julian downstairs, upstairs in the attic, Leanne is swaying back and forth as she's praying from the Bible that she had on the same page that she wrote Sean's name on. And that night, as they're eating dinner, Sean's sense of taste finally comes back. Although once again, at 2 a.m., Dorothy has another episode and attacks Leanne in her bed. And Sean can sense when they wake up that Dorothy isn't sleeping right. He actually gives her something to help with the bags under her eyes. And after Dorothy takes it, she tells Sean that she's pretty convinced that Leanne is just maybe days away from talking. She says that they're reprogramming her. And Sean says, well, as long as that's all we're doing, I want to be sure we're not crossing any lines. And that's when Dorothy suddenly asks him, have you been up there? But he lies to her and says, of course I haven't. When Dorothy heads off to work, Sean heads upstairs to the attic, and this time with a charcuterie board. Might have said that wrong. Those kind of boards are above my pay grade. And as they're eating on the meats and cheeses, Leanne tells Sean, I can't tell you where he is. But Sean tells her, "Uh, you don't have to, you can just bring him home. This conversation though is interrupted when Dorothy comes home early and Leanne tells Sean, you better not have her catch you up here. So he rushes downstairs where she's trying to stretch out her back because it still hurts from, quote, indoor skydiving. Now that night, when everyone's going to bed, Leanne waits until 2 a.m. She puts that mannequin in her bed and puts a blanket over it so Dorothy thinks that it's Leanne in the bed, but it's not. And when Dorothy goes to attack Leanne, Leanne smashes her in the head with something and runs downstairs. Although, she's not able to get out of the house because of all the locks. And Dorothy, who's bleeding from the head, comes downstairs and asks Leanne, where is he? And Leanne tells her he's in a better place, surrounded by people that love him. We keep him warm and we keep him happy and we keep him safe from you. And Dorothy gets so angry that she smashes Leanne in the head. Now, shortly after that, Sean ends up waking up in the middle of the night because his hand feels like it's on fire. He's got the sensation back. 
and after re-bandaging the gauze up, he walks by the attic and notices the door is open, and when he heads upstairs, Leanne isn't there. So he heads downstairs to find Dorothy just kind of standing in the doorway with a bunch of mud on her, and she's not really answering his questions. But you can tell that she did something real bad because she's covered in dirt. And that real bad thing was burying Leanne alive. She was nice enough to leave her a breathing hose, but Sean rushes down to the basement and digs Leanne up. And he pulls her out of that pit as Leanne is gasping for air. Dorothy has made her way downstairs, still having not said a word. Sean is mortified, and he looks at Dorothy and says, What did you do? This is too far. But Dorothy gets real close to Leanne and says, Nothing is too far. And as Sean is trying to console a sobbing Leanne, Dorothy just walks back upstairs. After Dorothy goes to bed, Sean lets Leanne shower up because she's covered in dirt and escorts her back up to the attic. And Sean is still trying to defend his wife, saying, yeah, she just loves him that much. But Leanne changes the subject, saying, you can feel the pain in your hand again, can't you? That's why you woke up and found me? And it seems like that's something that Sean never even considered as Leanne just heads off to bed. But downstairs, Dorothy is still having trouble sleeping. It might be because she just tried to murder somebody, or it might be because, as she said earlier, it's like her body is remembering something that her mind blocked out. And that's when suddenly she remembers over the summer standing over Jericho's crib. Because it was at 2 a.m. that she realized that she had left Jericho in the car. After the bold strategy of burying Leanne alive... Dorothy takes a different approach in episode 5 by being a good cop. She leaves the door unlocked and lets Leanne downstairs where Leanne finds Dorothy making pancakes, acting like nothing happened and everything's okay. Dorothy tells Leanne that her and Sean discussed it and they think it'd be best if they let Leanne out and about every day for a few hours. But as Leanne looks over at the door, it's padlocked. Leanne then notices that the table is set for more than two or three people and asks, is anyone coming? And boy, is somebody coming. It's Toby. Dorothy says, I thought you could use a friend. And Toby and Leanne have that awkward, hi, <laughs> sorry about kidnapping you, interaction. So Toby and Leanne sit down for breakfast, but when Dorothy tries to give Leanne some pancakes, Leanne says, no thank you. She's being very, very standoffish and cold. Sean then comes upstairs because Sean was in the basement just staring at the hole that Dorothy buried Leanne in. So the first thing he does is pull Dorothy aside and say, you scared me last night. And Dorothy is aware that she went way too far, but she tells Sean the fact remains we still need to draw her out. Hell, I actually thought you'd be proud of me for trying to devise a new strategy. They walk back in the kitchen where Sean starts to clean up breakfast, but at the table, Toby asks Leanne in front of both Sean and Dorothy, hey, how's everything going? And Leanne just gives a quick, good. Toby starts to apologize for everything that happened the night that he kidnapped her, but Leanne says, Mrs. Turner has made it quite clear, the situation. Toby then starts rambling, saying, it just sounds like you fell in with a bad crew. Same thing happened to me in high school. It wasn't religious, it was more like they did coke. And Toby ends up admitting in front of his bosses that he did coke. Which isn't the smartest move, so he decides to change the subject to Jericho, asking where he is because he hasn't seen him, and Dorothy cuts in and says he's with his grandparents today. Toby then turns to Leanne and asks, hey, when everything's better and good, do you want to go hang out, just the two of us? But Dorothy answers for her saying, when all this horrible business is behind us, Leanne will be allowed to go where she pleases. So after this awkward play date, Dorothy escorts Leanne back upstairs where she tells her more fun could be had if she just cooperates. You can see that I'm doing what I'm supposed to. But Leanne is still very standoffish with Dorothy and doesn't really accept her half-assed apology, just telling her, you can lock me up now. And with no TV and no radio in the attic, that night, in front of that mannequin, Leanne starts writing down a recipe from memory. The next morning, there's a knock at the door, and Dorothy answers it, and it's a package. And when she opens it up, she's mortified. It is a teeny tiny baby that is maybe the size of a thumb, with a note attached that says, bring $200,000 to a food court mall. And maybe the scariest part is the fact that it came from Sean's account, so they feel like they've been hacked. But Sean is fairly certain he knows who it is figures it's Julian. And when Julian comes that day, he tells Julian, we gotta talk about things like this. You've got her all riled up there. The issue is, Julian didn't send the baby. And if Julian didn't send it, and Sean didn't send it, then that means it must have been May and George. And they start freaking out a little bit. Because George had explicitly told him he didn't want money, but Julian says you didn't offer him enough. Now they both know that there's no scenario where Dorothy doesn't head to the mall with a large bag of cash. They need to devise a plan. They're able to scrounge up most of the money, having to sell off some assets, including Sean's prized coffee maker. And the next day, which is supposed to be the day of the drop, when Leanne comes downstairs, she tells Sean that she wants to bake a cake and hands him the ingredients. But Sean doesn't have some of them, and he's pressed for time, so he gets Toby to do it. 
That night, Toby comes over with the groceries, as does Julian. And as everybody is getting the money together and the assets, when Dorothy heads up to see what's going on with Leanne, she notices that Leanne has dressed up that mannequin in one of her tops. And she's kind of upset about it, but Leanne doesn't give a rat's ass what Dorothy thinks at this point, just walking downstairs. So as both Sean and Dorothy head off to the mall, Julian is going to stay there tasked with watching them while Leanne and Toby make this cake. But Julian's main focus is FaceTiming Dorothy while also FaceTiming Roscoe, the private investigator, who's on the second floor of the food court keeping an eye on Dorothy and Sean. So while Julian communicates with them over in the kitchen, Leanne starts making what's called a king cake. She tells Toby that she learned how to make it from her mother because her mother wanted her to have some talent for pageants. This after her mother also told her that she has no talent. She also tells a really sad story that her mom would always put on the brandy glaze if she didn't drink it already. And if Leanne performed well in the pageant, she would even allow Leanne to put the baby in the cake. Leanne was only allowed to do that four times, though. Her mother would tell her whoever found the baby was special, and somehow her mother always found the baby, and she would hold it up and make Leanne say, you're the special one. And this really stuck with Leanne, and she seems traumatized over it. Toby eventually asks, where's your mother now? And Leanne just mumbles, burning. But maybe the biggest observation is the fact that this tiny little baby that came in the mail with the ransom note was actually for the king cake. And that actually checks out because nobody's showing up at the mall for this ransom. It leads both Dorothy and Sean to think that maybe it's a setup. But when Julian goes to check in on Leanne, he finds only Leanne in the kitchen. He asks what happened with Toby, and Leanne says he had to go home. Julian, also worried that it might be a setup, tells Leanne, okay, it's time to go to bed, and he escorts her upstairs. And once he locks the door, that's when Toby pops out, because Toby didn't go home, he just hid in the attic, and Toby sees that Julian just locked her inside. Julian heads downstairs and is talking to Sean because the mall is closed and they're getting kicked out, and they're trying to figure out who sent this baby, who would have had access to Sean's account. And if it wasn't Sean, and it wasn't Dorothy, and it wasn't Julian, it must have been Leanne. So Julian heads upstairs to find Toby in the attic with Leanne, and he promptly kicks Toby out, and then turns attention to Leanne, saying, why would you do that to her? And Leanne just says, I want to see her get what she deserves. But downstairs, as the couple is getting kicked out, while still FaceTiming with Julian, having no idea that he's upstairs, all of a sudden somebody grabs the camera, and it's Uncle George, and he just says, Julian! And once Roscoe sees that, he gets the hell out of there telling Julian, sorry man, I can't do it. Now, Julian doesn't see any of this, so when the Turners get home that night, in walks Dorothy and in walks Sean. But to Julian's shock, in walks Uncle George, who screams at him, where is she? And she is just upstairs, housing King Cake. I mean, she's just smashing this stuff in her mouth. But the more she does it, the more she's not finding the baby. And she's getting more and more angry, and then all of a sudden, light bulbs that are next to her start bursting. Eventually, though, she does find the baby, and she holds it up to the mannequin, that you can only assume she's dressed up like her mother. Episode 6 starts off right where episode 5 left off, with George barging in the house, demanding to know where Leanne is. Julian gets in his way from going up the steps, and Dorothy tells him, if you want Leanne back, we need Jericho back. We explain all this to you in the car. Tensions are running high, and Sean can sense it, so he pulls George to the side to have a more civil conversation. While he's doing that, Julian does inform Sean that it was Leanne who sent the ransom note just to screw with them. Sean doesn't really care about that, though. He sits George down and says, we had a deal. Jericho would stay with us. But George says, that deal wasn't with me. George all of a sudden can smell something rotting and says it. And both Julian and Sean say, yeah, it's the pipes. We're getting them switched out. And George says aloud, of course, it's the house. He then starts making his way downstairs where he finds the hole that Leanne was buried in, although he doesn't know that. George tells both Julian and Sean that Leanne had caused this, the foundation crumbling, the burst pipes. But both Sean and Julian say, no, they were old pipes. They probably should have been replaced a while ago. George then starts to make his way back upstairs, but in the doorway is Dorothy. He asks Dorothy, how long has Leanne been here? And they say, about a week? And George gets so upset about hearing that, asking him, you kept her here all this time? George runs past Dorothy and finds the nearest window and immediately starts praying for the Turners, telling God they didn't know what they were doing. And while he's doing it, Dorothy is screaming at him, I don't need to be prayed for, I didn't do anything wrong. But George isn't even listening to her, turning to her and saying it might not be too late to fix this, and continuing to head upstairs. It's worth noting, though, as soon as he's done praying, it really starts to rain. George runs upstairs looking for Leanne in her room, but doesn't find her. And at this point, Julian's sick of George, so he's ready to throw down. But George kind of looks at him like, I'm not going to fight. What I want to know, though, is why aren't you frightened of her, of all she's done? I mean, that baby never should have been here. It was a mistake. Leanne needs to be returned to the house that you guys took her from. And Sean walks in the room, breaking up the conversation, sending Julian down the hall, telling him that Dorothy needs him. 
And really, the only thing that Dorothy needs him for is to vent about the fact that George keeps bringing up Leanne needs to be returned to the Westchester house. Sean really just wanted to have a private conversation with George. George asks Sean, what did you guys do? And Sean tells him, we needed help, and we thought she was the only one we could turn to. And George is kind of aghast and says, so you took her? You've got to return her. But Sean doesn't understand why it's so important Leanne goes back. So he tells George, explain this to me. What's so important about that house? So George sits down and tells Sean that Leanne has always had a rebellious streak ever since she was a child. She would often stray from the communal edicts. Sean cuts him off asking, what community are you talking about? And George tells him, you know who we are. You just choose not to. We're all amongst you, although we try not to take up space. You might see us on a street corner or under an overpass. We are the ones who have been given a second chance at life. And we use it to enact God's divine plan. We use it to help others. But we can only help the people that we are told to help. And Leanne disobeys that. So when Leanne brought Jericho here, and even coming here in the first place, that wasn't Leanne's call to make. She shouldn't have done it. That's the whole reason why Jericho couldn't stay. George also points out that Leanne meddled further and points at Sean's injured hand. George tells Sean his only hope is to take Leanne back to where she's needed. After that, pray for forgiveness. And the forgiveness that Sean will be praying for is the fact that when he got the call about going out to Los Angeles for that cooking show, initially he said he couldn't do it because they had a newborn. But when they called back, he thought, I might want a vacation. Jericho had colic, and both him and Dorothy weren't sleeping much, so he decided to take the call and go out to Los Angeles. It eventually led to Jericho's death. George looks at Sean and says, if you return her and you make things right, I'll undo what she did. I'll heal you. And that's how you'll be reunited with him. Although we don't know if he's talking about Jericho or God. Now in the attic, Leanne is hearing all of this because George and Sean are having this conversation right underneath her. And when she hears Uncle George say that, she kind of panics. George and Sean walk out of the room with George heading all the way down to the basement to make Sean an ointment for his injured hand. And Dorothy starts hounding Sean for details, but Sean tells her all George wants is Leanne back. Dorothy figures that George isn't in control. They need to get in touch with Aunt May. But that's going to be an issue because George doesn't have a cell phone. After this friendly reminder from Sean, Dorothy continues to grill Sean about what him and George were talking about in the other room. And Sean sheepishly admits that they were talking about returning Leanne back to that house in Westchester. Dorothy gets really upset at this because she's just sick of hearing that. And then Sean mentions how George talked about divine repercussions. And Dorothy is totally taken aback by this because it sounds ridiculous. Locusts, plagues, boils. And Sean knows it sounds ridiculous, but he's also kind of buying into it because he was the one that was dealing with splinters coming out of his throat. Sean brings up the fact that everything in the cellar started happening the day after they brought her back. But the more Sean talks, the more Dorothy's thinking that Sean's gone crazy. So just to get away, Dorothy walks downstairs. And Sean realizes he should probably talk to Leanne. So he heads upstairs in the attic. And Leanne asks him, what did my uncle say about me? And Sean tells her, your uncle said you need to be returned to the family in Westchester. Sean then asks Leanne, did you disobey your aunt and uncle by coming here? And she admits that she did. Sean tells her, you came here to help us, and we need your help now. But Leanne turns to him and says, I already told you. I don't think Jericho can come back here. But Sean is optimistic, telling Leanne, I think he can come back. I think we can fix this. And Sean's devised a plan. When he heads downstairs from the attic, he tells Julian, you're going to help me take Leanne back to that house in Westchester. You're going to pose a distraction to Dorothy. We're not going to tell her. We're just going to do it. And Dorothy is privy to this conversation because Dorothy headed downstairs in the basement where George was making that ointment and she brought him the bag of money. And initially George picks it up and Dorothy thinks, all right, he's taking the money. But he walks over to the hole that Leanne was buried in and just dumps it in there. To which Dorothy starts screaming at him about how he took Jericho. But George is focused on a large strand of Leanne's hair that he found in the hole. He shows it to Dorothy and says, she was down here? And Dorothy, who doesn't want to tell George the actual truth, just says, uh, yeah, I guess. George says aloud that Leanne's presence in the house is an infection that's spreading. He gets on his knees and starts to pray for Dorothy and the house and Leanne and asks Dorothy to do it with him, but she says no. Dorothy starts yelling at George, and when Julian comes downstairs, he sees that George is kind of close to Dorothy, and he throws him back, thinking that George is attacking his sister. He then notices all the cash in the hole and starts grabbing at it, and George chides him for being focused on the money. But all of this is going on downstairs, because upstairs, Sean is trying to execute his escape plan. But before him and Leanne leave, Leanne says, I'll go with you, but just promise me, you won't take me back to that house in Westchester. You take me far away so that they can't ever find me. Because my uncle is lying. He's never going to bring Jericho back here. Sean promises, but Leanne can tell that he's lying. And as he promises once again, and it seems like they're about to leave the house... They overhear the news on the TV say that there were gunshots at the house in Westchester that they're heading to. 
So Leanne and Sean are just dead in their tracks watching the news coverage. Now in the basement, George turns to Dorothy and says, if Leanne doesn't leave this house, but Dorothy just cuts him off and says, nothing matters unless I have Jericho. George tells her, you need to own the part that you play in all of this. But Dorothy starts to defend herself, saying, I didn't do anything to Leanne that she didn't deserve. And if Sean hadn't come down here, I would have left her in there. At that moment, Dorothy realized that she messed up. She accidentally admitted that the hole was for Leanne. And when George realizes it, he screams at her, you're never going to get Jericho back now. The two start screaming at each other, but they're distracted when cockroaches start crawling out of that hole. And I'm talking a lot of cockroaches. Enough to have Dorothy and Julian flee upstairs. And when they get upstairs, they see the same news coverage that Leanne and Sean see, and they're also frozen. And eventually, Uncle George makes his way upstairs, and when he sees the news coverage, he angrily yells, Look what you have done, as Leanne is frozen still, mortified. In episode 7, the group is still stunned by the news footage that they're watching. Uncle George yells at Leanne, Your disobedience has a cost. And then he sits down, his eyes roll back in his head, and he starts speaking in tongues. And Dorothy starts questioning him, what did you have to do with this? Was it May? But George isn't answering. And Leanne's so upset that she walks out of the room and Dorothy tells Sean, follow her, see what she knows. And Leanne goes up and locks herself in the attic. So Sean follows suit. Sean asks her, what happened to the Merino place? And as Leanne is packing up all of those busted light bulbs, she says, I never should have come here. It's all too late. Sean asks, why was the Marino family so important? And Leanne tells him, he sent me. Not Uncle George, but somebody reads the signs and tells us where we're supposed to go. Everybody has their place, and I disobeyed his will by coming here. I broke the rules. Sean asks her, what happens when you break the rules? But Leanne doesn't answer, and Sean gets interrupted by Dorothy, who's come upstairs at this point, because they're not getting anything from Uncle George. He's basically in a zombie-like state. And Leanne didn't answer because up in the attic, she found a switch, and she strips down and starts whipping herself as a punishment like she's done before. Dorothy, though, starts rummaging through her old files because she did more stories on this cult than anybody else. She knows more about them than the police. So she wants to prove that they're still active, and she figures that something like the Marino situation proves that they're panicking. So she starts looking through her files to see if they have done something similar before. But after coming up empty, she calls one of her contacts at the news station to find out more details. And what she finds out is it was a triple homicide, and the youngest son is missing. Now, Leanne is overhearing this conversation in the attic, and when she hears that the youngest child is missing, she crawls over to her Bible and pulls out a post-it note where the name Sergio Gomez is scribbled, and I mean scribbled, on this post-it note. And Sergio is the name of the youngest Marino child who's missing. And this news about the missing child has reached television audiences. So when Dorothy and Sean come downstairs, Julian's freaking out a little bit about it, saying, what the hell is this? They're taking kids now? What does that mean for us? But Dorothy actually thinks it's an advantage, telling him, it means we have leverage. Outside, though, they suddenly hear cop cars, and Julian thinks it's great because they can get rid of Uncle George in a zombie-like state. But Dorothy says, we're not getting rid of him. I need him to broker a deal to get Jericho back. If we give him up to the cops, we're back to square one just waiting for the phone to ring. So as the police are knocking on the door, Julian and Sean drag Uncle George's body into the kitchen and have Julian wait with him. And when Dorothy opens the door, it's Officer Reyes. She asks if she can have a word with both Dorothy and Sean, and when she comes in, she asks them, do you guys know the Marino family? And they both say no. And Reyes asks, what about their nanny, Leanne? And Dorothy doesn't answer the question, asking, all right, what is this? And that's when Reyes pulls out a screenshot of Dorothy on the news asking for information about Leanne, but also the pizza flyer. So Dorothy kind of comes clean, leaving out the whole kidnapping Leanne part, saying that they were gathering evidence until she had something substantive to bring to the police. And Reyes asks her, do you understand how illegal it is doing what you did? But Dorothy tells her, I knew you guys weren't going to believe me. The last time you were here, you treated me like I was a crazy person. Dorothy hammers home to Reyes that this cult has to be involved. It was the whole reason Leanne was there. They took my son, and now they've taken the Marino child. And if you had listened to me sooner, maybe you could have done something earlier to stop this. Reyes goes on to explain that Mr. Marino was under a lot of stress. And the note that he left implied that they're not looking for a missing child. They're looking for a missing body. Dorothy, though, tells her, that's what they want you to think. They must have written that note themselves. It's all part of their plan. But Ray shakes her head, saying, no, there's no cult involved. Sometimes the mind just sees what it wants to. But Dorothy doesn't seem to understand what Reyes is saying. So she asks her, so this is all just a coincidence. It's all just bad luck. It has nothing to do with us. And Reyes nods, and Dorothy says, okay, well, then nothing's changed. So why don't you go do your job, and I'll do mine? Now, while that whole conversation is going on, Leanne is upstairs in the attic watching YouTube videos of Sergio, 
Sergio was a YouTube streamer who reviewed video games, understanding that the market for television show recaps was taken, shameless plug, but Leanne was actually featured in a couple of these videos. One in particular, she's running around the house having fun with Sergio, but when Mr. Marino walks in, she straightens up. It seems like she's kind of scared of Mr. Marino, apologizing for playing around with Sergio, but he says, no Sergio, I'm just happy you're having fun. And while watching these, she's crying. So she continues to watch these videos, but at the same time, she grabs straw and starts weaving those crosses. Lord only knows where she got the straw in the attic, but she has it. Downstairs, though, Reyes is about to leave, but she asks if she can get a glass of water. And Sean has to run into the kitchen and help Julian move Uncle George's body because Reyes is in hot pursuit. Dorothy, seeing this, distracts Reyes in enough time so that Sean can get in there and move George and Julian behind the kitchen island. And when Reyes walks into the kitchen, Dorothy walks into the bathroom, so it's just Reyes and Sean. And Reyes tells him, Sean, I'm concerned. Dorothy involved herself in something very dangerous. Sean tries to talk it up to a reporter's instinct, but Reyes says, no, I've seen this before. People like Dorothy try to insert themselves into similar situations. They see a connection that just isn't there. She then tells Sean, I'd feel a lot better if I could look around. And she has to look around because the police can't ignore the connection between the Marino family and the Turners. And since she has a personal relationship with the Turner family, she would rather do it herself than other police officers coming in. And with that explanation, Sean says, sure. So he starts to escort her upstairs to look around. And when Dorothy comes back in the kitchen, Julian informs her that her husband is currently upstairs escorting a police officer around the house. And Dorothy knows that they need to move Uncle George again. So her and Julian drag Uncle George's body into the downstairs bathroom where Julian stays there with him to make sure he doesn't say anything. Upstairs, though, Reyes and Sean arrive at the office where Dorothy has compiled all of her research on the cult. And Reyes says, they're long gone, Sean. She then turns her attention to Leanne, saying, I feel like I'm not getting the full picture. And Sean starts coming up with this lie, telling her that when they got the baby, they hired a nanny. And they had a bunch of applications, and Leanne was Dorothy's favorite, so they hired her. But when she arrived, Leanne got really freaked out and left. And then Dorothy saw her on the street one day and became obsessed with her because she still viewed Leanne as her nanny. And Reyes thinks that's an awfully big coincidence. But they've looked at everything in that room, and the last place they need to look is the attic. And Reyes heads up there, and luckily for Sean, Leanne had heard them coming up, so she hides. But when Reyes gets up there, she is mortified, because hanging from the ceiling are a bunch of woven crosses. And Sean had no idea that this was going on. So when Reyes asked, did Dorothy do this? Sean is kind of forced to say, yeah, she comes up here sometimes. Reyes picks up one of those crosses and turns to Sean, telling him Marino was hurting and his wife was sick, and he refused to cope with the pain, drawing the parallel that Dorothy is having trouble coping with the pain of Jericho being dead. She tells him, your wife needs help. But then all of a sudden, she starts to feel dizzy, so she says, okay, I think we're done here. I'm going to see myself out. And as she's walking downstairs with the cross that she took, Dorothy catches her and says, I'll, I'll help you out. And Dorothy apologizes for the way she acted before. And right before she goes, Reyes turns to Dorothy saying, you can call me if you start seeing things differently. I'll be an honest friend to you. And then she leaves. And this comment kind of surprises Dorothy a little bit. But after Reyes leaves, both Sean and Dorothy head to the bathroom to tell Julian the coast is clear. But George is still in that catatonic state. The only thing he's doing really is grunting and every once in a while yelling Leanne's name. And Leanne, by the way, has made her way downstairs after Reyes left and made her way into that office where she turns on the television to find out the horrifying news that Sergio's body has been found after he was shot in the head. And she's really beating herself up over it, especially when the news anchor says, if only there was somebody else there to stop this. She heads back to the attic and in anger starts ripping down those crosses while bawling her eyes out. And finally, breaking the item she was using to whipping herself. And as soon as she does that, it starts hailing down from the sky, actually breaking the sunroof. Downstairs, however, Dorothy is reaching a breaking point with George and says, okay, George, let's make a deal. You can take Leanne back. She's your family. You bring Jericho back. We all go our separate ways. But George isn't answering because he's still a zombie. And Dorothy's getting frustrated and starts hitting him, trying to wake him up, but it's not working. They then get a knock at the door, and when Sean goes to see what it is, it's a package addressed to Uncle George. So he brings it inside, and it's an old wooden box, and when they open it, it's a Betamax tape. And that's when George casually walks out of the bathroom like nothing was wrong, saying, The answer is come. Leanne must watch the tape tonight. There's no time to waste. Where is your Betamax player? But this is going to surprise everybody out there. The Turners do not have a Betamax player. So George packs up the box, mumbling to himself, she must see the tape now. And Sean tries to stop him, but Dorothy says, no, Sean, let him go. And that's because there was a note in the box that says, reunite them Christmas Eve. And Dorothy takes this as a sign that they're going to give Jericho back on Christmas Eve. So let George do what he wants to do. But George grabs the box and heads upstairs to Leanne's old room and starts opening it up. And there's actually a box inside the box that the Turners didn't see. And in the second box, 
is what looks like a couple of vials, a rock, and a dagger. And finally, Sean had remembered that Uncle George was nice enough to make him an ointment, so he heads downstairs and starts lathering his hand with the spit ointment from Uncle George. Episode 8 picks up the next morning, and Uncle George is taking some of the liquid from those vials and just writing symbols on the walls. He then heads into the bathroom in Leanne's room and starts sharpening up that dagger while bawling his eyes out. Now, downstairs, the Turners are preparing breakfast for Uncle George, because Dorothy is thrilled about the note that she found. Sean warns her, are you sure this is what it means? And she says, yeah, what else could it mean? So Uncle George's crying fit is only interrupted when Dorothy brings him breakfast, and he walks out of the bathroom acting like he was fine. She lets him know that they ordered a Betamax player for him, but it might not arrive in time because they're supposed to get about 15 inches of snow. She tells him, I want to help however I can because we made a deal. And that's when she hands him the note, saying, this came with your box, it must have fallen out of it. George reads the note, looks at Dorothy and says, then you know, it is time. He then asks to use Sean's grill that's outside, which is kind of bizarre because it's snowing out in late December. And Dorothy has no idea why he wants to use the grill, but she allows him to. And when Sean sees it, he's a little perturbed. He kind of gives Dorothy a look and she says, don't give me that look. I've got everything under control. Now, the Turners do not know where Julian is. They figure that he slipped out early in the morning because their house is so big, but actually Julian didn't. He woke up and hopped online to research the fire that took out Leanne's entire family. He prints out some of the pictures and the articles from the internet, goes over to the attic door and knocks on it, but Leanne doesn't come down. He tells her, I was at your childhood home. I saw what happened to it. If you ever want to talk to somebody, you know you can talk to me. But Leanne still doesn't answer, so Julian goes snooping in her old bedroom where George is staying, and he finds the box. And after examining it, he finds the items in the box, everything except the dagger because George hid that. He finds the vials, starts sniffing them, but he can't figure out what they are. And he also finds a lighter, which he keeps. He then hears music, though, coming from the upstairs attic, and when he passes by the door, he notices the door has been unlocked and left open. So he heads upstairs. When Julian goes upstairs, she's playing a bunch of old records, and she's kneeling down in front of that mannequin in the green dress. She looks at Julian and says, what do you want? And he says, well, I know I'm only here because you want me to be here. You obviously want to talk, so shoot. And Leanne says, I don't even know where to start. Julian points to the mannequin and says, well, why don't we start there? Because that's a little odd. And she tells Julian that the mannequin reminds her of her mother. She shows him the news footage of the first day she met Dorothy at the beauty pageant. And all the way in the background, you can see the way that Leanne's mom is treating her. And it's not great. Julian asks, well, how close are your aunt and uncle to your mom? And she tells Julian that George and May are her, quote, chosen family. They're not even related. They told Leanne that God sent them down the road where God had buried her in ash, and that God had given her a second chance. She then puts on another record that she found, telling Julian that they're not supposed to listen to music because it's a dark temptation, and that's something that she doesn't understand. Julian then pulls up the articles that he printed out, showing them to Leanne, but Leanne's big takeaway is, look how my mom is holding me, so she wants to drop me. Dorothy would never hold Jericho like that. And Julian asks, what does Dorothy have to do with this? And she tells Julian that she used to think Dorothy was the best mom. But she was wrong. And Julian thinks that's really unfair because what happened to Dorothy was an accident. It wasn't her fault. And Leanne snaps back, then whose fault is it? And then Julian, pulling out that lighter that he stole from the box, lights himself a cigarette and says, for the time being, it's mine. He then plays a voicemail from Dorothy a couple of days before Jericho died. Dorothy is begging Julian to come over because she is overwhelmed without Sean around. The baby won't stop crying. And she asked Julian for two to three hours. But Julian never showed up because his dealer had gotten some really good drugs, and that was something that he couldn't pass up. And he's lived with this guilt. What would have happened if I just showed up that day? And the whole point of this story isn't to have Leanne feel bad for Dorothy. It's the fact that sometimes bad things happen, and you act like they didn't, but that eats away at you. Leanne then reveals to Julian how the house fire started in Wisconsin. It started because of her mom's green dress that she loved. Leanne decided to destroy it, thinking that maybe if she destroyed the dress, her mom would replace the dress with her. So she threw it on the burner, not realizing how fast a fire could start. But she wasn't even scared as the fire blazed. And her aunt and uncle told her that it must have been God working through her, because terrible things happen for a reason. But she looks up at Julian and says, if that's God, I don't want anything to do with him. Now, all the while this conversation's going on, the Turners had an unexpected guest. There was a knock at the door, and it was Roscoe. And Dorothy had never met Roscoe before, so she's a little surprised when he showed up at the door. But Sean reassures her, yeah, no, I do know him. And Roscoe says, hey, let's go outside and talk, which is odd because, once again, it's snowing in late December. And Sean fills Dorothy in that Roscoe was the private investigator that he and Julian had hired to look into Leanne. And that really annoys Dorothy. 
She can't believe that her nanny was under investigation and that information wasn't shared with her. He tells her, though, I didn't want to involve you. She then turns to Roscoe and says, well, what did you find? Anything that can help us get Jericho back? But he says, not really. I found an old burned down house. That's about it. She tells both of them, every detail we can learn about these people is important, no matter how significant it may seem. But the more that Dorothy talks, the more she's getting stressed out, and Sean can realize it, and Roscoe offers to go inside and get her a glass of water. And as he's doing so, he hears the basement door close behind him. And that's because Uncle George had gone throughout the house collecting a bunch of pieces of wood. And he went downstairs and put all the wood in a pile like a teepee in the hole that Leanne was buried in. And then he started speaking in tongues while slapping a Bible. So when Roscoe hears the door close, it really piques his interest. And it takes him a little bit of time to get a simple glass of water. He used the excuse that he had to go to the bathroom. At this point, though, the Turners have been sitting outside for a while, so they want to go back in. And Roscoe tries to convince him to stay outside, but they say, no, we're cold. We're going to head back in. And that's when Roscoe says, I'm sorry, I can't let you. He told me to keep you guys out here until sunset, no matter what. And Dorothy gets really pissed off and says, who? But then she realizes it must be George. So she barges her way in the house and finds George walking downstairs and yells at him. What, you just thought you were going to walk out of this house without living up to your end of the bargain? And he kind of looks at her dumbfounded and tells her, I needed time to prepare. We need to do these things alone. The reunion will happen when the clock turns. And that answer is sufficient enough for Dorothy. Sean, meanwhile, was kicking Roscoe out of their house. But before Roscoe leaves, he turns to Sean and says, Sean, just to let you know, something's happened to me. Things are changing and for the better. And it all started after I met him. I can't really explain it. But when he asked me for a simple task, I knew I had to say yes. What I'm trying to say is, you can trust them. They're not like us. They're special. And then Roscoe takes off. Now, back with Uncle George, he continued to go through the process to get ready to, quote, reunite them. Going into Leanne's room, blasting the B-52s while smashing his head against a wall, which probably led to a concussion, but he's bleeding pretty profusely from the forehead. He then heads outside to the grill that he lit, where he pulls out a poker, heading back inside and grabbing a piece of meat from the fridge and just throwing it in the sink. Now, the Turners have no idea what George is doing, and Leanne and Julian have no idea what George is doing, or the Turners for that matter, because they're still upstairs bonding. They end up kissing, a kiss leads to sex, and Julian gives her the ultimate compliment, bawling his eyes out because that ass is heavenly. But they end up falling asleep together, and Leanne is awoken when, shortly after midnight, Uncle George comes up holding that dagger, and Leanne asks him, are you planning on hurting me? You told me you loved me. And when she sits up, she knocks over a candle that starts a fire, and that really freaks out George. He falls back. But Leanne acts like she doesn't even know what's going on. She just tells George, everybody lies to me. And George is terrified and tells Leanne, she's going to come for you. And Leanne says, then let her. I can handle May. But he says, no, not May. And then he flees the house. Backing up into the street, all the while not taking his eyes off of the attic window, which Leanne is at, and Leanne watches her uncle get hit by a car. She also, by the way, did put out the fire, kind of. And this is all going on while the Turners are sleeping. But right before they went to bed, Sean did check his hand, and his hand is pretty much cured after using that ointment that George had made for him. Episode 9 takes place the very next morning, and it's the morning that Dorothy figures Jericho is coming home, so she gets the entire room ready. She then heads to George's room and starts knocking on the door, but he doesn't answer because she doesn't know George is not there. She heads up in the attic to find Leanne and asks her, do you know where your uncle is? And Leanne tells her he left. Leanne, however, does not fill Dorothy in on the circumstances that led to George leaving. And Dorothy figures that he left to go get Jericho. And he'll be back for the lunch that they're having with Dorothy's father, his new younger girlfriend, and Julian. But Leanne knows George isn't coming back. She then heads downstairs and Sean, who is preparing a goose for the lunch, says we don't have to do this but Dorothy says no we do because Jericho needs his family today so Sean heads off to continue cooking lunch but outside Julian his dad and his dad's girlfriend Courtney Courtney with a K are discussing the circumstances regarding this lunch and what they're going to do with Julian filling his dad in on the fact that they think Jericho is being brought back Julian says with Dorothy's fragile mental state you probably shouldn't ask too many questions Courtney wants to get filled in because in her defense all of this is pretty confusing. They had a baby, then it was a fake baby, then it was a real baby, now the baby's gone, baby's coming back. But Julian's pretty rude to her. He has no time for Courtney with a K. The group then heads inside knowing that they have to be on their best behavior because of Dorothy. And even though Courtney with a K tells Dorothy that she's a big fan, Dorothy is just like her brother. She has no time for her. Julian, on the other hand, acts super weird when Leanne comes downstairs. And while Leanne is planning on talking to Julian later, she wants to talk to Sean first. 
She tells Sean that Uncle George left. He's not coming back. Sean used the example of his healed hand, saying, your uncle wants to help us. But she explains how her uncle isn't like her. He's not willing to break the rules. She asks Sean, what is Dorothy going to do if he doesn't come back today? And that's a question that Sean doesn't even want to think about. Because Dorothy has really banked on Jericho being back. She's even going outside and looking in the street to see if a car is coming. He heads down in the cellar and meets with Julian to start figuring out what wine pairs best with a duck. And he tells him how Dorothy said she'd follow Jericho if there was a chance there's something else. But Julian says Dorothy wouldn't be so stupid. Sean, however, isn't so sure. He's having trouble predicting what she'll do. He tells Julian, we have to be prepared if things don't go as expected today. But Julian shoots back, you don't seriously think that that man is going to bring your son back today, do you? But Sean does, in fact, believe George is bringing Jericho back because of the evidence. The note, Roscoe, what he said to Dorothy the day before. Sean thinks it's very possible. They then head upstairs and everybody sits down for lunch. But right before they eat, a few of them hold hands while Sean says a prayer, saying how everything they have is great, but what they really want back is Jericho. And this really sets off Julian, who is already on edge to begin with. His father tries to calm him down as he starts freaking out about the fact that Sean dare say a prayer in his own house. And Julian makes it about him and the pain that he's suffered in his life. Shortly after they actually agree to eat, Dorothy hears a car outside and she rushes to see if it's Jericho. And Julian is getting nonstop phone calls from Natalie. It gets so bad that he excuses himself and does a bump of cocaine in the bathroom. When he heads out, he heads to the liquor cabinet, but he ends up running into Leanne. And she asks him, how do people act after, and he just cuts her off and says, they don't. What we did was a mistake. She tells him, I feel different now, Julian. We're powerful. It feels good. He tells her, though, this isn't right. I'm not right in the head. And she gets really close to him saying, then let me take your pain away. Just like I did last night. He's kind of backing up and says, what are you doing, Leanne? And she just says, what I want. Julian, though, gets called away by his father. And he heads into the living room where they're all playing charades. Everybody except Dorothy and Sean because Sean has gone outside to be with his wife as she waits for Jericho. She's getting concerned, though, that she might have been wrong about this whole situation. She asks Sean, could they possibly be testing us or watching us? And Sean tells her, don't think about that. Think about Jericho back in your arms. She then starts telling Sean everything she's planning on doing with Jericho once he returns home. Eventually, Sean and Dorothy walk in where Julian, their dad, and Courtney with a K are all playing charades. Although, Julian is getting more and more frustrated because... He just doesn't like Courtney with the K's clues. Dorothy, however, figures it out immediately, but she does go to check the news for accidents because the weather isn't great. And her dad tells Sean, hey, it seems like things are getting fraught. Maybe we should go. But Sean says no. She could use her support. Stay, please. And as Dorothy is checking the news, Sean starts up a game of Jenga while Julian is in the bathroom bumping more cocaine. And while he's doing it, he's listening to the voicemails from Natalie. And Natalie's been calling him nonstop. And on the message, she tells Julian, I know how you're feeling right now, and I know you refuse to acknowledge it. I want to help you. Let me try to speak with you. You don't have to go through this shit alone. I don't know why you keep insisting that you do. But as soon as the message ends, Julian collapses. And he's not discovered until Courtney with a K tries to go to the bathroom and barges herself in where Julian's body collapses out. And immediately everybody starts freaking out because it's clear that Julian is overdosed. So they call the paramedics as Sean tries to do CPR on him to revive him. Now, Dorothy was late to arrive because she headed down to the basement. But when she does, she looks absolutely horrified. And no matter how much Sean tries, he cannot get Julian to come back. At one point, he actually just gives up, deciding to wait for the paramedics. But that's when Leanne comes downstairs, smacks on Julian's chest, and then kisses him. And all of a sudden, Julian shoots up. He's just staring at Leanne the whole time, and she explains, you were dead. You had stopped breathing. But the only thing that Julian can say is, I saw him there. He seemed okay. Although, he never answered the question about who he was talking about. You can probably ascertain, though, that it's Jericho. The paramedics arrive and start checking on Julian, and he lies to him, saying that he just took ibuprofen, but his dad shows them the baggie of cocaine. So the paramedics take Julian back to the hospital with his dad and Karen in tow. And while they were sorting that outside... Leanne had headed downstairs into the basement, and she sees what Dorothy was up to. She was creating a noose out of clothing. So she heads upstairs to confront Dorothy about it, and Dorothy is just standing over Jericho's crib in kind of a stupor. She tells Dorothy, I saw what you made in the basement. But Dorothy says, Sean mustn't know about that. Dorothy tells Leanne that it's a contingency in case Jericho doesn't come back. And Leanne asks her, you would die to be with him? And Dorothy just stares at her and says, of course, Leanne. I'm his mother. Sean, though, is downstairs looking all over for Dorothy and he can't find her. And that's when he gets a knock at the door. 
from a woman who is in a black shroud, looking like she just came from a funeral. And when he opens the door, she says, Mr. Turner, I understand you're looking for Jericho. And in the season finale, Leanne is upstairs with Jericho when this woman shows up at the door, and Leanne looks terrified. She introduces herself to Sean as Aunt Josephine, saying that she's brought a Betamax player for Leanne. And when Sean asks, where's George and May in all of this, she says, they're no longer involved. Now, Dorothy heard the knock at the door, so she comes down to investigate and sees Aunt Josephine sitting there. And after Aunt Josephine introduces herself, Dorothy asks her, where's Jericho? Have you done something to him? Josephine kind of laughs that off, saying no. But then she apologizes to Dorothy, saying that she was never supposed to be involved in all of this. She also adds that she understands how much Dorothy has done to try to get Jericho back, but it's time to end this. She then asks for a chance to see Leanne, but Dorothy is in denial about everything she's just heard, and she definitely doesn't want this woman seeing Leanne. Sean, however, kind of convinces Dorothy to let Josephine see Leanne because Josephine's, quote, there to help. So under the pressure, Dorothy agrees to let Josephine see Leanne for 15 minutes. But after that, she wants answers. When Sean goes upstairs, Leanne is standing, clutching a mini statue, ready to hit somebody in the head with it. But it's as if Sean doesn't even notice it. He explains that someone's there to see her. And when Leanne says, well, who is it? Sean explains that it's her Aunt Josephine. And Leanne begs Sean, do not leave me alone with her. But it's kind of too late because Dorothy and Josephine are already headed upstairs. So Leanne and Josephine head up to the attic where Josephine asks, what do you want, Leanne? And Leanne explains, well, I want to stay here with the Turners. But Josephine explains how that isn't an option. She tells Leanne, you know the Turners don't love you. You can't be happy here. This conversation, though, appears pretty one-sided and also pretty quick because Dorothy, who has decided to go into Jericho's room staring at the baby doll, is caught by Aunt Josephine. And Josephine tells Dorothy that her and Leanne are leaving that night, but since she made Dorothy a promise, she plans to keep it. She then hands over the onesie that Leanne found all crumpled up in the basement, telling Dorothy that it's, quote, the truth that she's seeking. Sean, though, is in the room down the hall, and he calls up Julian saying, hey, something's happened, I need you to call me back. But then he notices that Jericho's door is closed. And since he's really concerned about Dorothy harming herself, he starts knocking on it, but Dorothy isn't answering Sean. Dorothy's fine, but she's just looking all over this onesie for a message. So since Sean isn't getting an answer, he walks back to the room where he left his cell phone, but he suddenly can't access it. The passcode that he's using isn't working. And that's when the door suddenly slams shut, and when Sean goes to try to open it up, he can't. He's locked in. So Dorothy is transfixed and Sean is locked in another room. And at this point, Aunt Josephine has made her way back to the attic where Leanne has set up the Betamax and Josephine hands over the tape for her to play. And it's this old tape from probably the late 80s, early 90s with this guy named Uncle Frederick who seems to be one of the higher ups in the Church of the Lesser Saints. And in the video, he's explaining how to return a, quote, lost member. And to do that, it's a three-step process. The first step is the invocation, where you listen to music that you really like, music that makes you feel, quote, connected to the earth. And as you're doing so, you beat the crap out of yourself. The second step is the consecration. That's where you blind somebody using oils, your hands, a knife, and you stab them, separating the soul from the body. You then heat the blade of a knife, slicing the limbs, And at that point, the soul can be released from the body and be reunited with God. And after that, there's only one more step, the emancipation, and that's just where you burn the body. Uncle Frederick explains to the viewer that while the process is pretty difficult, because the people may have once been family, you should never forget who the real adversary is. Then suddenly, the screen is filled with a bunch of demonic pics, and then the video ends. And as soon as the video is over, Josephine questions Leanne as to why she made the decision to abandon her post and come to the Turner residence. And Leanne tells her it's because Dorothy needed her help. And Josephine asks, well, did you help her? And Leanne emphatically says yes. But Josephine reminds Leanne, we are here for one purpose, and that's to serve him. Now, let's see if you can be saved. She starts making Leanne pray to God, but then she tells Leanne to announce to God that she's going to forget Dorothy Turner. When Leanne doesn't want to do that and tries to make a run for it, that's when Josephine grabs some of the oils from the box and throws them on Leanne's eyes, temporarily blinding her. Leanne tries to make it downstairs to the kitchen where she starts feeling around for a knife, and she is able to find one. But over in the corner, Josephine is stabbing herself in the leg, as Tutti Fruity is playing in the background because that's the first step. So Leanne is scared, temporarily blinded, and she knows she needs to get the hell away from Josephine, so she goes into the basement, using the sink down there to try to wash away whatever has blinded her. Now upstairs, 
Sean is trying like hell to yell for Dorothy, but Dorothy's in this trance-like state. He decides that he's going to climb out the window because the door is locked, but right before he does it, he turns and notices that the door is suddenly opened. So he walks back to Jericho's room and demands that Dorothy open the door, but after smelling the onesie, she got a creepy feeling, and she's hooked up a noose. It's Sean's worst nightmare. She tells Sean how she's not opening the door because they've killed him. She's just gotten horrible feelings, and she knows that that's the case. Sean begs her to open up the door so they can figure this thing out, but she tells him, I need to be with him, Sean. I'm sorry, Sean. I don't mean to hurt you, and I hope you can forgive me. But he screams, I'm never going to forgive you for this. But Dorothy seems to have made up her mind, telling him, I'm sorry. I've made the decision. Sean, though, continues to try to talk Dorothy off the ledge, but down in his basement, he's completely unaware of what's going on. Josephine has made her way somehow inside, even though Leanne had locked the door, and Leanne is crouched under the steps, hiding as Josephine starts to light a fire for the final step. Leanne tries to make a break for it, but Josephine grabs her, stabbing her with the knife and then cutting her arm. Leanne is only saved when Dorothy actually smashes Josephine in the head with a shovel, knocking her out. Dorothy seems pretty surprised about what she found in her basement, and she checks on Leanne, who assures her, I'm okay. Dorothy starts to call for Sean, but Sean can't hear her, so she says, I'm going to go get Sean. But right before she heads up, Leanne tells her, Josephine wanted you to think that Jericho was gone, but he's not, and I'm going to bring him back to you. And Dorothy is elated at this news, but she heads up to grab Sean. When she does that, Leanne turns to Josephine's knocked out body and says, see, she protected me like I'm her daughter. She then grabs the knife and walks over to the fire to start heating up the blade, but then she's suddenly grabbed by Josephine again. Josephine starts choking her, and she only stops when Leanne is able to get the shroud off of her head. And when Josephine grabs the shroud to put it back on, Leanne, who is freed up at this point, says, Vanity is a sin, and then stabs her. Leanne and Josephine suddenly disappear. I mean, by the time that Dorothy gets back downstairs with Sean, which, by the way, didn't take all that long, the fire is out and the two are gone. And Dorothy, who had told Sean about the fact that Leanne told him that she was bringing back Jericho, knows how this all looks. So she starts swearing to Sean that she wasn't making all of this up. The two start looking all over the house for Leanne or Josephine, but they can't find either of them. And Dorothy is convinced that Leanne simply went to go grab Jericho. But Sean doesn't believe that's the case. He starts to tell Dorothy what really happened to Jericho last August. But Dorothy is so preoccupied by putting batteries in the baby monitor that she just tells Sean to shut up and then she turns it on. And when she does that, you can faintly hear somebody that sounds a lot like Leanne in the background. And Sean is convinced that they're simply picking up another person's baby monitor, but the two walk over to Jericho's nursery, and when they open the door, Leanne is standing there with a baby. She's standing there with Jericho. She hands over Jericho to Dorothy and says, we're going to be a family now. And then she lets the Turners have their time with their baby. She then heads to a room where she's talking to herself, saying... I don't know why I keep doing bad things. Honestly, I scare myself sometimes. I can feel the dark thing in me getting bigger. And after she says that, the power goes out on the entire block. But when the lights go out, she is unfazed, just sitting in the dark, saying, I'm tired of everybody telling me what's wrong with me. Maybe nothing's wrong with me. Maybe this is just who I am. But I know how this works. I know they're coming for me. But don't worry. I'll be ready. Because I know killing you started a war. And it turns out that Leanne isn't actually talking to herself. She's talking to the charred body of Josephine that she's stuck in the wall. And that is how Season 2 of Servant ends. Thank you so much for watching this recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Thumbs down if you don't. You all know to do that. Be nice in the comments section. Do not be a jerk. If you don't like the video, just keep moving. And check out my podcast, Scene Invaders, for my thoughts on actual, you know, things. And that is how Season 1 of Servant ends. Thank you so much for watching this recap. I really appreciate it. Consider subscribing to the channel. If you don't, though, I'm not going to be upset. But if you like the video, hit thumbs up. If you don't, hit thumbs down. Just don't be mean in the comment section. I have feelings too. And hey, if you have a social media platform, there is a share button for a reason. Sharing is caring. So put that John on your MySpace. But thank you so much for checking this recap out.